and I'm going to guide you through the entire webinar. I am Mimi Amachi, and I'm working at the Security Division at UMATSAT. So some background on this webinar. This event is part of a series of three webinars organized to keep stakeholders informed about the access and exploitation of satellite data operated by UMATSAT in support of sustainable development in Africa. It complements the 14th UMATSAT User Forum in Africa, which is planned to take place during the week of the 13th to the 18th of September later this year in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So please keep this day marked in your calendars. These are organized in partnership with various African institutions or initiatives. Part two of this webinar will take place on June the 8th under the title, African Climate Monitoring from Space. This webinar is dedicated to the Meteosat third generation, also known as the MTG in Africa, and is co-organized with the African Union Commission. So, um, yeah, we, you're following this on Slido right now. So there's also, got, there's also a translation function for our French speakers and for our English speakers. And just for information, this is also being recorded and it's also been live streamed on YouTube at the same time. And after this webinar is over, this webinar will also be able to be, uh, yeah, watched over YouTube itself, over our Facebook page. And I also encourage you to use social media to advertise this event, and you can use our official tags, hashtag EOAfrica and at Everything. So we are honored to have our three distinguished guests today. We've got um, Mr. Harsen Yambe, Head of Environment, Climate Change, Water and Land Management at the AUC, which is gonna be followed by the Director General of UMATSAT, Mr. Phil Evans, and then this opening is going to be bookended with Dr. Amos Makarau, the director of AMCOMET Secretariat. I want to thank them for opening this session with their introductory remarks, and I give the floor to Dr. Harson Nyambe. Dr. Harson Nyambe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Moderator, for giving us the floor. And of course, to, to the organizers or co-organizers who have actually invited us to this uh, very important uh, uh, event. Uh, let me start by recognizing the Honorable Minister of uh, Civil Aviation of the Arab Republic of Egypt, and who is also the chairperson of the African Ministerial Conference on meteorology, and that's uh, Honorable Mohamed Enaba. Uh, I would also want to recognize uh, Mr. Philip Evans, the Director General of uh, the European Organization for Exploitation of uh, Meteorological Satellites. Uh, and of course, uh, the representative of the European Commission, uh, representatives of uh, regional economic communities, and regional organizations, distinguished delegates, so, and of course, I uh, should not forget uh, AMCOMET Secretariat, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to express uh, the gratitude of the African Union Commission on behalf of Her uh, Excellence, Ambassador Josefa Sacco, Commissioner for uh, the Department of Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy, and Sustainable Environment, who could not make it to this event due to equally important assignments. And of course, I would want to express appreciation to UMEDSET as well as an AMCOMED Secretariat for this webinar and uh, for inviting us to be part of it. Uh, improving observational networks, data access and processing constitute one of the five strategic pillars of the Integrated African Strategy on Meteorology, Weather and Climate Services. Therefore, the UMEDSET third generation products are critical to successful implementation of the African strategy. It is thus a strategic objective for Africa to ensure sustainable access and use of existing and future geostationary and polar orbiting weather satellites, particularly the Meteosat third generation satellites 
for sustained provision of weather observations over the whole African continent. And as at a short period of as short as 10 minutes. Within the context of Agenda 2063, the Meteor said third generation satellites will play a significant role in Africa's efforts towards realizing the continent's aspirations for a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. While reaching several goals of Agenda 2063 will be facilitated by the MTG, realizing the environmentally sustainable climate and resilient economies and communities goal will be a direct outcome of the contribution of the MTG. The MTG will also contribute to efforts towards enhancing resilience of livelihoods and production systems to climate variability and change. Agriculture production, disaster risk reduction, health, transport, infrastructure, blue economy, and several other sectors. In ensuring AU member states smooth transition from meteor set second generation to meteor set third generation, my office has swiftly moved forward to implement the decision of the African ministers responsible for meteorology, as well as the AU's Ministerial Specialized Technical Committee on Agriculture, Rural Development, Water and Environment. In a nutshell, a joint working group was created in October 2019. The group has since met five times and has actually achieved the following, identified the priorities for Africa, and prepared concept notes as well as a developed resource mobilization framework. The AU, regional economic communities, regional organizations, and regional organizations have since started engaging with partners, particularly the European Union on possible funding. To this end, I would like to thank the EU for continued partnership with Africa. For two decades now, the EU continued to support African meteorological services uh, through Puma, MSD, MESA, and now, of course, uh, CLIMSA project. What a I also thank the European organization for the exploitation of meteorological satellites for the support provided to Africa particularly in facilitating African countries and institutions to access satellite-based meteorological data through its umet cast system. Finally, I would want to reassure you of the African Union Commission's commitment to support this migration process to meet your set third generation satellites. I thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks, Dr. Harris Nyambe. Next on the line, it's our Director General, Phil Evans. Phil Evans, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nyambe, Head of Environment, Climate Change, Water and Land Management at the AUC. Dr. Amos Makarau, Director of the AMCOMET Secretariat, WMO Regional Director at the Office for Africa. Dear colleagues and participants at this first African webinar, in 2021 from UMETSAT. It's my great pleasure to be here speaking to you today. Um, I took up my uh, duties as the new Director General for UMETSAT on the 1st of January this year, uh, and I replaced uh, Alain Rattier, who many of you would know. Uh, and this is one of my early events, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to open it and to meet you uh, and sadly I can only do so remotely um, but hopefully I get the chance to meet some of you face to face in time. I would like first to thank our colleagues from the Ankermet Secretariat and the African Union Commission not only for co-organizing this event today but also for the sustained and lively cooperation that was established over the past years to ensure that African users can get access to Meteosat data and to start preparing for the transition from Meteosat second to third generation in Africa. 
Let me also underline in this respect the work accomplished by the WMO Region 1 Expert Group on Satellite Data, the RADEG, and by the Joint Working Group um, on the Abidjan Declaration, with whom we have been working closely to identify priorities for the transition from MSG to MTG. As a result of this work, two weeks ago, the fifth session of the African Ministerial Conference on Meteorology has adopted the update of the Integrated African Strategy on Meteorology. This strategy highlights the importance of strengthening African capacities to access and use the Meteosat third generation data in line with the Abidjan Declaration signed on September uh, 2018 by the African Union Commission and the RECs. This is a major achievement, but it is also the start of a new journey. Let me assure you of UMETSAT's commitment to continue supporting the user community in Africa in this new endeavour. On our side, we are working hard to ensure that the spacecraft and ground segment will be ready on time and the MTG data will be available as quickly as possible for operational use to support weather and climate services. It is also for us and our member states, states a major step forward, which will need also in Europe an increase of capacities. As highlighted by the Abidjan Declaration, the strengthening of the African capacities to fully benefit from MTG is absolutely at the heart of our cooperation. This webinar today will be the first opportunity to share with a larger audience information about MTG, the new data, the associated challenges and the expected benefits. Over the past 20 years, the European Union, the African Union Commission and the regional economic communities, AMCOMET, WMO Region 1 and UMETSAT have worked jointly under various programmes to ensure operational access in each and every African country to the Meteosat data. These programmes have also supported the establishment of various weather, climate and environmental services in support to sustainable development and decision makers in Africa. I'm convinced that we can build on this partnership to approach the challenges of the transition to MTG. I wish you all a very enjoyable webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much for your opening remarks. That was our Director General, Mr. Phil Evans. Next, for the, our third distinguished guest, Dr. Amos Makarao, the Director of the AMCOMED Secretariat. Dr. Makarao, the floor is yours. Marianne, sorry to intervene. Uh, Marianne, could you speak on behalf of uh, Dr. Macarao because he has not joined the room yet? Uh, hi, uh, uh, Vincent. He said he was going to join and make, make his own uh, statement. But, uh, well, I could uh, just say that uh, I'm Comet uh, is uh, very grateful to uh, UMATSAT for uh, having providing support to the national med services for more than two decades now, and still uh, carrying on uh, um, capacity building, ensure that we can use um, the satellite products and make our forecasting. This has been a pleasure also to be working with um, uh, AUC, who provided a lot of support to AMCOMET. And as you said it in the beginning, we just finalized the AMCOMET uh, strategy, the revised integrated strategy on meteorology, weather, and climate services. So uh, we'll be carrying on working together and ensure that uh, from uh, MSG to MTG, all users are able to use those products and make early warnings, make tailored products for all users. So I will stop there and uh, Amos will join later on and speak for WMO and AMCOMET. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marian Diop Kane. So we'll just continue. 
So um, as you've seen, if uh, you're familiar with the Slido tool, so we only use the Slido tool also for our questions and answers. And for anybody who is also connected in YouTube, and if you fail to connect over Zoom, you can also go to the Slido. So you got an email. And in the email, there's also the hashtag how you can connect to the webinar. So after this. Hello, uh, good morning, good morning. Uh, it's Amos Makara, can you hear me now, please? Yeah, we hear you. Yes, I thank you very much for having internet problems here. Uh, I have to apologize for that. Uh, so may I uh, continue with my uh, uh, opening address? For sure, the floor is yours, Dr. Makara. Okay, yes, thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to begin by actually uh, greeting my, my old friend, my good friend, Mr. Nyambe of the AUC and your team. Also, um, we noticed that we have made the uh, events. We is now the new DG. Congratulations and welcome on board. And we are also, uh, and I said that we have also have ministers joining this. That is actually very pleasing and we also wish to welcome them on board. Uh, we have also um, our experts and as well as our members. Uh, in WMO. Uh, yes. We want to join everyone in congratulating the AUC, UMESAT, and the AMCOMET uh, facilitators for having this webinar. This webinar is very, very critical in the sense that it's taking place right now when um, Africa is having problems with respect to uh, the observational data, particularly ground based data. And at the same time, we're experiencing extreme weather events, floods, trials. Uh, 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 and also look at invasions. And so definitely this seminar is coming at the right time when we can see how best we can, we can prepare for the MTG preparation and make use of the products that are on stream right now. We are indeed very grateful that um, we have uh, an interest uh, from the regions. Only two weeks ago, we had a meeting uh, in the region uh, at as well as that one, the RA1 session, in which uh, we such also featured very, 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 uh, very prominently, and uh, and after the presentation by UMESAT, there were many questions. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm glad that uh, this webinar is taking place just after these two meetings, so that now UMESAT can actually uh, 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 express in details what its work plans are, particularly uh, in preparation for the launch of MTG, and also what is expected of members of states in, okay, in preparation of that. We are looking also forward to the Work of the of RIDEC, of RIDEC, uh, RIDEC being much more much more effective. Also, if the AMSOP facility, which uh, which established a few years ago, we want to make sure that it is actually becoming much more effective because right now we are experiencing more and more requests for uh, data, which will require uh, a remote sensing. So, uh, with this remarks, definitely, I'm looking forward uh, to the participation to the participation of the member states. And also for us as WMO to know how we can, we can continue to collaborate with UMESAT and AUC so that at the end of the day, uh, um, when the launch is uh, okay, uh, done, all the member countries are, are, are prepared. In closing, I also wish to inform you that in line with WMO reform, we are restructuring all our subsidiary bodies, and that includes right there. So um, we are going to be calling upon those experts within the regions, within, uh, within Africa, who are who can participate in this working uh, group with uh, better with appropriate qualification so that we are able to appropriately do this. We have okay, I think with these remarks, I would like to uh, wish the meeting success. I may not be able to participate the, okay, throughout the whole meeting, but definitely with Marianne and, and my colleagues in the VMO, we'll be able to, uh, able to make any uh, to continue to. Uh, to participate in whatever way we can. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I wish to meet you well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much for introductory remarks. So this ends our introductory uh, inter our introductory introductory session, and this leads us into the first session, which is benefits for Africa. And I would like to give the floor to our Director General, Phil Evans, for the first presentation. He's going to hold a presentation on the introduction to MTG. This is going to be followed by Leanne Simpson, the chairperson for the WMO, RIDEC. And she's going to hold a, another presentation. After that, we're going to have a 15-minute Q&A before part two of the first session will start. So I give the floor to our DG, Phil Evans. The floor is yours. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief and summary overview uh, of, of UMETSAT. Uh, UMETSAT is an organization and its missions uh, and a brief overview of the upcoming um, MTG program without going into a great deal of detail, uh, just to set the keen scene uh, and the context. So if we could uh, go to the first slide, please. Um, this is um, this this slide shows our current configuration of, of missions. Uh, as many of you will be aware, we have the um, MediaSat 9, 10, 11 satellite systems, METOP, A, B, and C, as well as uh, as well as a number of uh, Sentinel missions uh, that we are now operating. And of course, these already provide um, a, a hugely important and valuable. Uh, set of data uh, for the European community, for the African community, and globally, and provide a critical underpinning to the delivery of weather and climate services. Next slide, please. But of course, they build on a, a, a long heritage for UMETSAT of, of satellites and missions that go back to 1977 and through all of that time we've worked hard um, on our partnerships we've worked hard on ensuring not only that we get uh, our platforms and our ground segments up and ready but actually that the data that we provide is as fully exploited as possible by our member states and our partners and that exploitation is built into our convention as an organization. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is, um, uh, as you'll see, uh, a Mediasat image. And I think it captures uh, a very, very important point very succinctly, because you will see from this image um, that the data and information that we get over Africa is in many respects far better uh, than uh, we get over Europe. And I think it, in a very simple way, demonstrates the potential uh, value of our satellites and the potential value of the uh, next generation. Um, and just to reiterate, our member states are, have been and remain committed to ensuring that the African community gains the maximum benefits that they can from the platforms that we are operating, from the data that we are disseminating, uh, and hence a strong involvement uh, with yourselves. Next slide, please. So this is just to uh, illustrate some of the existing applications that currently operate. Uh, and it's through these applications that actually the real socio benefit, socioeconomic benefit of our systems is crystallized uh, in society. These are the really, um, these are the really important things, uh, services and applications that are relevant and valuable to end users. Just to run through a few examples, and there are more. Um, we can see uh, the dust monitoring service that is uh, operated by ACMAD, uh, where we are able to give people advanced warnings of dust or sandstorms so that they can protect their health, remain indoors if that's possible and protect themselves from the adverse impacts uh, of dust and sand. Our observations of precipitation uh, provide information on soil moisture um, and that is extremely valuable for agricultural applications. And of course, one of the critical impacts on any community is severe weather events, whether that's the impact of cyclones or very unpredictable, very intense and very short period convective events that can have such devastating local impacts on communities. And our satellites support uh, the forecasting uh, of all of these things. Next slide, please. So, Amidiasat third generation 
uh, platforms are composed of um, of two elements. Uh, the first one, and and probably the most significant um, for uh, the African continent, is our um, two imaging missions, MTGI. These instruments uh, carry, these platforms carry two primary instruments, the flexible combined imager that provides high resolution, rapidly update full disk imagery every 10 minutes in 16 bands, uh, and a new lightning imager, which uh, the relevance of that I will come back to shortly. Uh, and the start of operations is hopefully in 2023, an exploitation um, will continue for decades after that. And of course, these instruments, certainly from a climate perspective, uh, continue and extend the baseline of, of data records over the continent. Next slide, please. The second element of, of MTG is the um, sounding mission, uh, which will carry an infrared sounder and will provide enhanced three-dimensional information uh, over the African continent. This will start operation hopefully in 2024. And again, uh, its lifetime will carry on for decades. Next slide, please. So just a few, um, just a few examples of the benefits that will come from the MTG. Um, uh, this is a graphic of, uh, of demonstrating the benefits of the uh, rapidly updated imagery that will come from NTG. And here in this image, you can see how it tracks um, the development of a severe weather or high impact weather event. Uh, and this sort of input is likely to be hugely valuable um, for the development of now casting services in the region. Next slide, please. Uh, this graphic shows, I mean, it's a demonstration of the improvement in resolution that we're expecting to see from our imaging instrument. Um, the image on the left is uh, the current resolution that our uh, Meteosat platforms perform at. And the image on the right is what we expect to see from the new platform. Clearly, uh, the resolution is, um, is much more enhanced and this has will bring benefits across a range of applications, whether for se severe weather input to modeling systems, uh, the benefits are obvious. Next slide, please. I touched on, um, I touched on the lightning imager that will be flying on the MTG platform. And this is a new development. Obviously, um, lightning imager is a good, um, the lightning imager is obviously uh, strongly linked uh, to severe weather events and in the region can be a very important a precursor and forecasting aid for yeah. severe weather events. And also this instrument will be very important in supporting air traffic management over the region uh, and is a new um, and is a really new and exciting uh, enhancement to our capacity. Next slide, please. Yes, fuck. <laughs> um, uh, this is again a comparison between our, um, our current uh, our current instruments performance and what we expect from MTG. Uh, this is a graphic from a single channel of the imager used to identify, um, uh, detect, and monitor fires, and you can see again a dramatic improvement in resolution between the two instruments that will enhance uh, enhance all the services that will rely on this, but in particular give better regional and local detail and allowing better discrimination of what's going on on the ground. Next slide, please. Now, clearly, the enhancements provided by MTG uh, provide a great deal of opportunity for the continent to enhance uh, the services, whether weather services or climate services to the continent, um, to support sustainable development, to deliver huge benefits to society. But there are challenges uh, associated with that. Um, 
the region, uh, and I'll come back to this in a second, needs to develop and enhance its capability to utilize this data and develop products and services off the back of it. But also the data volumes um, will dramatically increase, as you can see from the chart on the right between the two platforms, and that will be uh, a significant challenge. Um, but of course, discussions around the challenges uh, of the new, uh, new data feeds from MTG and how the continent can address them and fully realize the benefits. The conversations have started on that uh, and are on, have been ongoing for some time. Next slide. Uh, and of course, key to that is the Abidjan Declaration uh, and the strong political support for what Africa needs to do to benefit from the new platforms, to develop and, its, and enhance its own capacity, to develop services and applications that genuinely meet um, the end user needs uh, of the communities. And I think this recognition uh, and the statements made in this de declaration are incredibly positive and incredibly helpful. Next slide, please. So I'd just like to conclude with a few remarks. As I've already said, exploitation, supporting the exploitation of our data is built into our convention as an organization. And it is only through the exploitation of data through services that actually the value, the contribution that we make as an organization is really crystallized. And we remain committed as an organization to support that in Africa, which is one of the reasons that we're running um, this webinar series. But of course, critical to realizing these benefits is partnership working um, and working with the AUC, AMCOMET and WMO is crucial to ensure that the potential benefits are delivered. Um, and just to remind ourselves that MTG um, will be here for the next two decades. And actually, the process by which we exploit the benefits of it will take time and sustained effort and sustained capacity building. But we believe the potential impact to society, to African society, are huge. And we're very excited about the prospect of launching this new platform. Uh, and with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your presentation, Director General. So before I continue with our next presentation, I just want to tell some of the participants that if they check their email, there is a new Zoom link with which they can reconnect. So with that, I'm going to give the floor to Leanne Sampson, who's going to have a presentation about MTG for Africa and the main applications. Leanne Sampson, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and a very good morning to everyone from a wonderfully warm and sunny South Africa today. And I would just like to, to firstly thank you for the invitation to address this group of distinguished guests and to really um, be part of the conversation uh, from a RIDEC point of view, from a meteorologist's point of view is very, very important and, and has what has been touched on uh, by, by the other speakers before me and distinguished guests from, from AUC, UMETSAT, as well as ANCOMET, it's really encouraging to hear that all of the support um, is there and the encouragement for Africa to still receive and to exploit as much out of the satellite uh, missions that, that, that are being um, used uh, at the moment and, and for the future. I, I remember that transition from the first generation satellites into, into second generation. And um, the direct, Director General touched on it briefly now as well, how MSG has, has really changed the face of operational meteorology, uh, even climate monitoring services in the last um, 20 years or so, where we've moved from three channels that could be visualized into a world of applications and product development that include the dust monitoring that include air mass distinctions, um, severe weather monitoring and, and forecasting as well. And now I feel very privileged to be part of a group that is in the conversation around how do we now make the transition into the next phase 
the third generation of satellite that is coming, where we're still in a phase where I don't believe that Africa has really exploited the second generation satellite to its extent. And we're already on the brink of, of the next phase. And so we, we find ourselves in a very privileged position in Africa where our young meteorologists coming into the system have the benefit of learning and bringing ideas into development and enhancements with satellite imagery, having been exposed to the second generation products that we currently experience and, and making that transition into the third generation with a lot of uh, enthusiasm and, and possibly a different way of thinking. But then we also have our experienced meteorologists and, and members of our national meteorological um, services and hydrological services where we can see what is needed from a higher level point of view and, and how do we take ourselves into that next step. And it's in conversation with UMETSAT and COMET, the AUC, to, to understand what is the need on the African continent and how do we work together with the various organizations and bodies and working groups to make sure that these needs are understood and that they are clearly tabled for people who, who are able to help in that decision making and the implementation thereof. And so um, this transition into MTG is, is going to be really exciting uh, for us. And as RIDEG, we have an extremely difficult job at the moment of balancing um, you know, the need in Africa uh, with MTG and how to balance the limitations that there are obviously with the bandwidth and getting the data to, to people who need it, um, not just for visualization, but also for development. And, and we need to make sure that these, that these two aspects are, are balanced and that we, we really do make use and full use of the third generation satellite and technology. Could I have the first to the next slide, please. So I, I broke my, my thinking into two different aspects. And we have the obvious gains of, of MTG. And you know, these, these have been touched upon um, a little bit now in, in the last little while. And so the, the benefit of the, the spatial and temporal resolution of the channels is always something that helps to improve the products and services that are offered um, on the continent and to the continent, of course. But sitting here thinking and, and listening to the Director General speak and, and looking at the imagery and seeing the comments coming through from the attendees and saying, wow, you know, the resolution looks amazing, and it does. Uh, like we saw the transition from first generation to second generation, we could all of a sudden see all kinds of features uh, to help us and, and now into the third generation even more so. But what is actually needs to be changed as well is the impact that this new imagery and data has, not just from a visual sense where things are clearer to see um, and, and make more sense in an operational environment, but for people on the ground, on a continent where extreme weather events have an impact to communities that are extremely vulnerable and require as much information and as much lead time as possible to try and deal with some of these, these disasters that, that can now be more accurately forecast. And so we need to, to link the benefit of better visualization, spatial and temporal resolution with how do we translate that back into Africa on the ground to make sure that we are servicing the community as national meteorological services and hydrological services. And the, the increase in the channels, obviously, um, we, we now start to get a bit of range um, of, of information coming in, particularly fire detection, as we saw, which is, which is one of the major hazards um, across the continent. And being able to combine imagery uh, for, for um, visualization purposes, our RGBs that we're used to, but also obviously being able to overlay um, sandwich products and, and, and uh, products such as that. But what got me really excited and many other people that I've spoken to is the introduction of the lightning imager. The lightning imager can, has so many benefits um, across the board. So being able to fill the gap where we potentially don't have radar imagery on the ground, which for most of Africa is a reality. The radar network is very sparse uh, where it is. 
We're very fortunate down in, in Southern Africa to have radar imagery that covers um, most of South Africa, the Sutu, Swazi, uh, Eswatini, um, but, but that's not the reality for the rest of the continent. And so being able to have near real time uh, lightning data that is coming through can also help to, to close those gaps in, in data sparse areas so that early warning systems, now casting of severe thunderstorms can, can be improved and enhanced for those people on the ground experiencing it. But of course, with that data set in combination with a ground-based lightning data sets provides an, an amazing opportunity for research and development in climatology. And so we, we have an operational and a long-term and medium-term benefits that, that can come from this data set. And as I said, this makes me um, personally very, very excited. Uh, the early warning systems in Africa is, is a very important factor as well. As I said earlier, the, the high risk that the communities face with aspects such as flash flooding, um, normal flooding, large scale flooding, severe thunderstorms, um, you know, these, these aspects are taking lives. They are, um, the, this weather is causing destruction of infrastructure and, um, and, and property. And so if we can help to mitigate that, um, that needs to be important, but, but how do we mitigate it? And it's by, by product development. And the product development also needs to start in Africa because we as Africans understand what our vulnerabilities are and what we need. We can't only rely on uh, augmenting um, solutions that come from outside of Africa to, to fit into Africa. We also need to come up with ideas and to drive these ideas uh, to be able to implement um, products and services that are put, uh, specific for our needs. The next slide, please. So uh, similar to, we saw a few images um, in the previous presentation as well, where we do see the benefits and the enhancements of, of what we can see from the, the new satellites and instrumentation that, that we'll, we'll have access to. And on the left-hand side uh, of each of those images is, is just the current state, which is really good. And um, being able to identify life cycles of thunderstorms, being able to identify various phases of cloud um, and cloud distribution and cloud type moves into a whole new sector where the, the actual small scale features that are particular to severity can be better understood and, and, and better visualized as well. And of course, on a better time, um, resolution, we can now start um, a warning system that is uh, can potentially um, save more lives and, and put more um, mitigating factors into play. Uh, next slide, please. So similar, we, we saw this image a little bit earlier as well with the true color RGB. And I think this is this is just an example of um, you know, being able to detect various features such as volcanic eruptions, as we see in this image here. And volcanic eruptions, dust storms, smoke fires, visibility-based um, hazards. These, obviously, for our aviation community, are extremely important, along with the lightning imager and, and the, the products derived thereof. And this is an industry that needs as much information as possible. Africa is a large continent. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of air traffic um, north to south across the continent as well, um, into and out of Europe. And, and to be able to better um, package what we're doing from an aviation point of view is extremely important. And the inclusion and the enhancement of these products uh, will most definitely benefit um, on the continent. Next slide, please. So this is an, an overlay with some of the, the lightning imager data, what we can look forward to seeing. And as I said, I find this very, very exciting because at the moment, yes, we can dissect um, some, some severe thunderstorm aspects, but just being able to look at what is being done at the moment elsewhere in the world with, with other instruments of similar capabilities to what we are expecting with MTG, here we can see that we can find not only the severity within the cloud in terms of the lightning flash density, um, but we can also find gaps within that. And again, filling the gaps between the radar um, or areas without radar um, will, will become very, very important because at the moment there is a limitation on that. 
that uh, anything north of the South African border at the moment. And that's over an area of the globe which receives most lightning um, because of the convective activity. We can now start to have a look at how that how that's going to, to pan out and the climatology of that based on, on the MTTG data is going to be extremely good. And to start now putting into, into play products that can be used. And, and, and I'll reiterate again, bringing in young meteorologists coming into the system, um, putting together research and collaborative efforts, um, even with those who have more experience um, from Europe, from the US, from Australia, to try and understand how can we tailor this into an African, uh, an African product as well. Um, next, next slide, please. And then I had, so we had the obvious gains. These are the, 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 the imagery and, and the data that is there. But, but what are the not so obvious gains? The things that are a little bit beneath the surface. And, and this is really where the right egg group and, and the other working groups have to come in. We need to function in, in that layer slightly underneath what is obvious and make sure that the conversation is around how do we keep these working group, groups relevant? And as was, was mentioned earlier, you know, with the new WMO strategy to make sure that the, the working groups that are there, that they're focused and those that need to, to be there having the conversations are kept and so that we can, we can maintain a continuity in what's happening and understand across the world of meteorology what is, what is possible and, and how do we keep things moving forward. So, so to me, aspects such as research opportunities, as I, as I keep alluding to, collaborative projects, training, and designing of development of operational products, these are needs in Africa. But there are needs that Africa have to solve for themselves as well. And so I would like to see in this next step, this transition into the third generation, a drive that includes Africa developing their own products, working closely with UMEDSAT and, and other partners to be able to produce services and functions on the ground, which are Africa specific. And, and as I said, I don't think we've exploited MSG to its full extent yet. And we're already on the brink of, of, of a whole new piece of technology. And so the time is right. The time is, uh, is here for us as Africa to stand up and, and we need to try and, and drive that forward. And um, mentioning to colleagues leading up to this webinar is my thinking was always be a participant and not a recipient. Africa needs to participate. And, and in participating, help the whole system to improve and, and, and get to the next level. Next slide, please. And that's where AMSAF comes in. So this presentation of mine links really nicely with the benefits coming and the technology that is there and, and, and what we can potentially do, but what processes are in place to be able to facilitate that. And that's the AMSAF, the African Meteorological Satellite Application Facility. And that's really African products for African users. And we need to, to drive this and to make sure that this gains momentum and, and keeps climbing, because this is how we are going to maintain that collaborative effort between African meteorologists and scientists and the technology owners. And you know, so between UMETSAT and Africa, and as I say, other partners, collaborative efforts to be able to produce products that are specific to Africa will bring immense opportunity for research and development, not just of the products, it's the development of the people, and it's the development of the users as well um, in, the, in the community. And, and that's where we need to, to, to focus, is making sure that the, the users of the data are participants, not just recipients of the data. Next slide, please. So if we look at capacity building, it, it needs to be at various levels. It can be at your national meteorological and hydrological service levels, so at your local, your local uh, institute, but also regionally. So we have RA1, the Africa group as a whole, but within RA1, we also have subgroups that exist within that. And it's, it's, it's making sure that the conversations are not just happening at an Africa level, because that doesn't always filter down into the national level. And when the national level gets, gets involved, 
even with universities and other research bodies, that is where we start seeing development happening. And so the AMSAF really focuses, uh, aims to focus in three particular areas. And that would be for atmosphere, marine, and, and hydro and, and agrometeorology. And that's just the starting point. It's, it's the branching out from there uh, to make sure that we reach in, into more and as many sectors as possible. Next slide, please. So the clear and foreseen benefits of the AMSAF as we see them at, at the moment, again, um, uh, the aviation and marine and, and transport um, communities are, are the benefactors. Um, natural disasters, early warning systems, really, really important at the moment in, in the meteorological space is impact-based forecasting, vulnerability studies, and, and how the weather um, impacts communities. So not what the weather will be, but rather what the weather will do. And that is where we need to add value to the data we're getting. Whether that data is from satellite, radar, observational data, we need to add value to that as, as users and to make sure that the community benefits from that um, at the end of the day. And those long-term benefits um, particularly spread into um, water security, food security, and, and health, and, and, and the socioeconomic benefits as well. So what, once we get the understanding and the use of the data to an optimal level, the winners at the end of the day are the African community, the people who um, get the early warning, the people who can try and put things into place to, to mitigate damage uh, in the long run and to be able to plan. So we don't only think from a, a damage and disaster perspective, we also need to look at, at opportunities and, and how can people better use the data to enhance their own, their own user capabilities and, and to move forward, not just to make sure that we are seeing all the destruction, but also that we can create a more positivity and, and development in the future. Next slide, please. So what is the future? When I speak about the future, what is that? The future with the coming MTG involves a lot of engagement. And from a ride perspective, we're very privileged to have a group of, of um, members within the expert group who range from a training, background, forecasting, operational backgrounds, hydrological, agrometeorological, um, NWP, uh, physical. It, 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 there's, there's an abundance of knowledge and, and user scope that we have. And the, the group itself is a, is, a, is a group that needs to communicate, not just with one another, communicating with focal points in the various countries and regions, communicating with the various stakeholders at all levels to understand what the needs are, where the pain points are, and to bring those to the table and discuss them in an open forum. Because we find that these needs and these challenges transcend the boundaries of the countries that we originate from and the regions that we are each uh, representing. And when we can find solutions that transcend these boundaries, we can, start, we can start implementing those and then take them down to the regional and national level um, in, in our own communities as well. And so the RIDEB group plays an extremely important role. And, and hence, when, when hearing of a new restructure within the WMO and the working groups, making sure that we make our voice heard across the platforms that we have with our stakeholders to say, please, we need to keep the communication channels open and partnering, be it with the meteorological services and hydrological services, the regional training centers, the centers of excellence for satellite across the continent, this is how we have the conversations and this is how we we help the communities the the meteorological community as a whole but the african community at the end of the day as well i think that is my last slide but perhaps yes it is so um that was from my perspective um and I, again i'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity um to address the group and and to thank everyone for the support that the ride deck uh, group is receiving and I can promise you we are focused on um, producing uh, solutions and conversation and um, those kind of integrative and collaborative work across the, the continent to ensure that the data sets that we have and the access to data we have is um, what we need and, and that we work with UMETSAT in particular to exploit this data and these opportunities uh, to the fullest. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks a lot for your presentation.
So we now move on to our question and answer session. So during this webinar, we're only taking questions over our Slido tool. It's on their website, and there's also going to be a link posted in the uh, chat area. So yeah, you can you can enter the question with the link, and we're only going to take four questions for this session now for the sake of time. And if your question isn't answered, it's going to be right now, it's going to be answered during the course of the day. So the first question we take is from Michel Massard, and it's for Leanne Simpson. And his question is, was the dust monitoring tool used for the container ship in the Suez Canal? Wow, that would, that, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, I'm personally not aware uh, of whether it was or not. Um, it's the satellite imagery that I have seen uh, broadcast about that um, event last week was more about monitoring the actual situation there, not from an atmospheric um, meteorological point of view. So I'm not sure what um, the conditions around that were, but um, you know, if there was dust uh, that was causing a hampering issue, I'm sure that the users um, around that area would have made use of it. But I think, um, you know, the, the difficulty they were experiencing was a, more of, a, of an engineering problem on their side. Um, but it would be interesting to go back. And there is access to archive imagery. If you actually go to the UMETSAT website, um, there's a link to the UMET View website. And you yourself can actually go back to last week. There's an archive of about two weeks of, of data there. And you can reproduce that that dust rgb yourself and actually have a look and and go back and and understand the situation but it's a very interesting question um to uh, to think of the meteorological aspects while thinking of uh, the the news that is making global headlines thank you uh vincent also has some information on this question vincent yes. Thank you, Mimi. Just to complement what uh, Lian just said, uh, I would like first we have some uh, uh, participant from Egypt Med Service in the in the room. So maybe if they want, they can also uh, use Slido to uh, provide an answer. And I would like also to mention that uh, the dust monitoring data are also used uh, by a forecast, a dust forecasting center, which is located in Spain and which covers the full um, Sahara region of Africa, inc including the, the Middle East. And there is always the issue on a more than daily basis, a dust forecast. Uh, so it might if this was used or not, we don't know, but uh, there are some products, not only the dust monitoring, but also dust forecasting, which are um, made available by the metrological community for Africa and also for the um, uh, Arabic Peninsula. Thank you. Thank you for the answers. So the second question is from Pawan and it states, I have a question to the speaker. ITCS, Belt in Africa, has cloud cover assuming that UMETSAT satellites does not have radar data. How do you produce images in these regions? And this is also for Leanne. Okay, thank you. So the, the instrumentation, the platform that is used to produce the images is a geostationary satellite. If we're thinking MSG and, and moving into the MTG environment, these, these platforms, um, the payload, sits up at about 36,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And it is sort of centered over the Atlantic Ocean at zero degrees east-west and on the equator. And the footprint is what we call it, covers Europe and the whole of Africa and across towards um, the east as well. And so we produce imagery from the, uh, the satellite instrument itself from a scanning um, perspective. It scans the atmosphere and on board the, 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 the platform there are multiple sensors on board. So the current platform would have uh, 12 different channel capabilities to be able to produce imagery. The new platform on NTG will have 16 um, different sensors for what we call the flexible combined imager or what's, what's getting the imagery for cloud and, and weather system detection and, and atmospheric detection. And so this raw data is taken and then uh, used through software to visualize. And so we can visualize 24 hours a day, currently every 15 minutes, but uh, from, from the MTG uh, era onwards, every 10 minutes, we would be able to monitor the growth and decay of, of weather systems. 
and uh, cloud systems as well. And so this data, these data sets are used in various applications. So sometimes we visualize it as clouds, as, as we've shown in the examples, um, to be able to see the cloud development. Sometimes the data is put into prediction models and used as part of algorithms uh, to solve other product issues and to create forecast products. So there's various uses of the data. Um, it's not a picture. We actually create it for what we need. And so although there's, there's, there's no radar capability on the geostationary um, satellites that we use, there's various instrumentation on other, instru on other um, craft, so such as the METOP project, um, where you know you have a, a polar orbiting satellite, which is then sensing and, and collecting data in, in a whole different way, where it can see through the cloud to the, the surface-based features to be able to understand land usage, to be able to understand uh, wind on, on the sea surface and other um, oceanographic and marine-based um, uses as well. So there's various uses of the data set and how we visualize it to be able to fill the gaps and to be able to create um, the type of information that is pertinent uh, to the use of, of the user at the end of the day. I hope that answers your questions. Perhaps um, from a UMETSAT point of view, there can be a more technical answer, um, but hopefully that has, has helped you out. Thank you so much. So the third question is from Miguel Barrios. And it asks, considering the enhancement in spatio-temporal resolution, does UMATSAT foresee any enhancement in tools to search, retrieve, and visualize data as well? And this goes to Vincent. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Miguel, for the question. So for, just for the sake of time, uh, I will just redirect you to this afternoon session where we will speak a bit more about uh, data uh, access mechanism. But, uh, uh, very shortly, the answer is yes, we are preparing. We will continue to rely on UMETCAS to distribute the data, but we are also developing additional tools that will allow the, the processing, uh, the, the reprocessing, yes, with cloud and the uh, retrieval of the data. So I will invite you to join the afternoon session to get a more precise answer to your uh, questions through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And then there's one more question, and it's in French, so I'll also give the floor. Oui, merci, Mimi. So, la question uh, est quels sont les principaux changements entre MSG et MTG en termes de fréquence temporelle? Uh, ce qui est très important pour le, la prévision, uh, le no casting, la prévision instantanée, mais aussi uh, les produits dérivés utiles pour la prévision des phénomènes extrêmes. Uh, Alors, pour, pour répondre à cette question, euh, effectivement, il y a des les principaux changements ont été euh, mis en évidence dans les deux présentations de mon directeur général et de Liane. Euh, la fréquence temporelle, principalement, va passer de 15 minutes à 10 minutes. Vous aurez un peu plus de détails là-dessus euh, dans la, présente, la première présentation de cet après-midi sur l'instrument FCI, donc l'imageur de MTG, euh, puisque euh, pour l'Afrique, ça dépendra quel canaux, il y aura des fréquences temporelles un peu différentes euh, dépendant des, des, des canaux. Euh, mais effectivement, les, les phénomènes extrêmes sont un des, euh, des phénomènes que, que, que MTG observe très bien et pour les canaux qui sont utiles pour la détection des phénomènes extrêmes seront eux distribués à 10 minutes au lieu de 15 minutes actuellement. Voilà, merci. Thanks, Mimi. Merci. So with that, we move to our next section. So, and this is about socioeconomic benefits, and we'll hear presentations from ASECNA, AgriMed, and ICPAC. And then the, uh, there's going to be the last one from Serpinet. So the first speaker is Nuria Mikwe Asumumbeze, Head of Forecast Service at the Directorate of Meteorological Operations at ASECNA. And her presentation will be about MTG, the ASECNA perspectives. So Nuria Mikwe, you have the floor. Bonjour, merci beaucoup. Je ne sais pas si je me fais entendre. Oui. Oui, vous pouvez avancer. Merci. En fait, la présente présentation va s'articuler sur trois principaux points à propos de la SEGNA, la vision et la mission 
En deuxième point, on va parler de, de la méthodologie au sein de la SEGNA. Le troisième point, c'est sur la coopération avec MEDSAT. Et en quatrième point, on va parler d'une conclusion. Suivant. Créé à Saint-Louis, au Sénégal, le 12 décembre 1959, et avec son siège à Dakar, la SEGNA fournit le service de la navigation aérienne dans 17 pays africains. Elle gère un espace aérien de 16 millions de kilomètres carrés répartis en six régions d'information de vol. Suivant. Depuis son installation en 2017, le directeur général, M. Moussa, a une vision de positionner, positionner l'agence comme l'un des meilleurs fournisseurs de services de la navigation aérienne et de la maintenir comme un instrument exemplaire de coopération et de cette vision est matérialisée à travers son plus grand programme déjà en cours de, de matérialisation, qui est la création du ciel unique africain. Suivant. La SEGNA est chargée de la fourniture de services de la navigation aérienne en route dans l'espace aérien sous sa responsabilité. Vous pouvez avancer, s'il vous plaît. Les services de la circulation aérienne d'approche et d'aérodrome, les services, l'assistance météorologique à la navigation aérienne, elle assure également le service de lutte contre incendie et sauvetage des aéronefs, ainsi que la publication des informations aéronautiques. Nous avons des expertises aussi sur la définition, les études, les spécifications, l'achat, la réception et l'installation de, de nos systèmes utilisés dans, dans la SEGNA, au maintien en condition opérationnelle des équipements et installations, à la formation à travers ces trois grandes écoles, les AMAC, l'ERSI et l'ERNAM. On a l'expérience aussi sur la calibration des navettes ainsi et la gestion des aéroports dans le cadre des activités aéronautiques nationales, ce qui nous a valu la certification ISO 9001 version 2015. Suivant. La météorologie au sein de la SEGNA. Conscient du fait que les conditions météorologiques dangereuses sont une des principales menaces pour la navigation aérienne et un facteur contributif dans les accidents et incidents de l'aviation, notre principal objectif est la réalisation des zéro incidents imputables aux conditions météorologiques non prévues. Ces objectifs n'est atteignable que si nous, nous réussissons à faire de l'information météorologique une donnée stratégique crédible. Dans ce sens, l'agence s'est engagée à moderniser tous les équipements et moyens d'analyse et parallèlement à ce plan, un, une plan, un plan de formation qui a pour objet de maintenir les capacités et compétences de son personnel. Next, next one, please. Avec ces modifications, ces modernisations, pardon, avec, bien sûr, tous les systèmes acquis et en cours d'acquisition dans le domaine de la météorologie par l'agence, nous permettront d'assurer un service de niveau mondial dans nos différents centres et également de positionner l'agence comme leader 
dans la fourniture de l'assistance météorologique pour la région affine. Et ainsi, dans le cadre du, du programme du ciel unique africain, obtenir la reconnaissance mondiale de l'excellence de la SEGNA à travers sa designation comme centre régional d'avertissement de phénomènes dangereux. On est en train de se préparer, préparer notre candidature pour abriter ce centre régional de la zone AFI. Suivant. OK. La coopération avec le MEDSAT. Depuis 1980, la SEGNA utilise les produits satellitaires. Et par moyen d'une convention, cette coopération entre la SEGNA et l'UMEDSAT est principalement axée sur trois. L'accès aux données, qui, au vu des services aéronautiques fournis par la SEGNA, à différents utilisateurs sur la base des données et produits satellitaires de Mersat, une licence du type fournisseur de services nous a été accordée en 2018. Dans la formation avec l'EAMA, la coopération est étroite dans le domaine de la formation en météorologie satellitaire et aux applications associées pour le continent africain dans le cadre du plan de formation l'assistance et les interactions, la coordination des activités techniques et administration entre les deux entités. Suivant. Please. Okay, thank you. Nous sommes conscients que l'exploitation des systèmes déjà installés et en cours d'installation à la SEGNA, associés aux valeurs, aux valeurs ajoutées des météosats troisième génération pour la météorologie aéronautique, notamment le Lightning Imagia, vont contribuer, entre autres, à des prévisions plus justes à la localisation des foyers orageux, au meilleur suivi et localisation des cendres volcaniques, à la détection et suivi exact de localisation des phénomènes dangereux. La contribution à l'ordre du MTG pour notre travail est noto et important. Suivant. Next one, please. En guise de conclusion, il faut retenir que MTG va beaucoup contribuer à notre objectif qui est de faire de l'information météorologique une donnée stratégique et crédible. Et déjà à la SEGNA, avec un système de navigation très sûr qui est le SBAS en cours d'installation, L'information météorologique crédible, des infrastructures modernes et un personnel qualifié et compétent, nous sommes sûrs que nous allons arriver à la réduction des incidents, à les routes flexibles et voir dans un futur les free route airspace, à des vols régulières et sûrs, à la confiance des compagnies aériennes à la réduction du temps et la consommation du carburant, entre autres. Nous souhaitons être informés du progrès du, euh, du MT pour nous, pour nous permettre à notre tour d'adapter nos équipements et procédures afin de pouvoir recevoir comme maintenant les produits MTG la formation de notre personnel ainsi que 
être prêts à l'avènement de MTG. Nous sommes à la SEGNA, nous sommes contents de, des avancées qui nous va nous proposer MTG pour notre travail. Et cela étant dit, je vous remercie de votre présence. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mrs. Asumu Mbeze. Next is the speaker, Issa Garba, the expert agropastoralist at Agrimet. Issa Garba, the floor is yours. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh, J'ai l'honneur de, à mon tour de présenter au nom du Centre régional Agrimet de, ce que nous attendons de euh, ce nouveau euh, MTG. Ma présentation sera axée sur euh, à peu près quatre points dans celle, celui que vous voyez ici, c'est-à-dire la présentation du Centre régional Agrimet, qui est une institution spatialisée du SILS ayant pour mandat de travailler pour la sécurité alimentaire, la gestion des ressources naturelles, la lutte contre la désertification, la maîtrise de l'eau et l'adaptation au changement climatique. C'est une entité qui est reconnu depuis un certain temps comme bras technique de l'UMOA et de la CEDIAO. Elle est maintenant reconnue comme centre climatique régional au nom de la CEDIAO. L'ambition d'Agrimet est d'assurer la sécurité face aux aléas Climatique. Nous avons un nombre important de partenaires que vous voyez. Diapo suivant. Next. Next slide, please. Alors, au niveau, nous avons comme infrastructure plusieurs antennes, dont une antenne Emetcast. Nous avons euh, des centres euh, spécialisés pour les calculs, dont une HPC et des stations comme Station Mesa et East Station. Nous avons également euh, des, une antenne euh, VSAT et des laboratoires plus une base de données euh, unique à son genre qui date d'environ 40 ans et qui est mise à, mis à jour régulièrement. Suivant, s'il vous plaît. Issa, Monsieur Issan, on ne vous entend plus. On ne vous entend plus. We cannot hear you anymore, Issa. Je suis là, je euh, oui, je, je disais, en tout cas, pour ce qui est de des services que nous menons, il s'agit essentiellement des services sur euh, euh, le suivi de la veille sur la campagne agricole à travers un premier temps euh, la prévision saisonnière euh, pour les pays euh, de, du Sahel et aussi pour euh, la zone du golfe de, du Guinée à travers la prévision euh, 
euh, des, des écoulements, la prévision agrométéologique des séquences sèches, etc., etc., et la prévision, en tout cas, des, euh, des, des pluies, des cumuls, des cumuls euh, saisonniers de pluies. Nous faisons, euh, je dirais, le suivi de la campagne agricole et nous déterminons les zones, les zones à, à risque. Les informations sont diffusées euh, à travers euh, des bulletins mensuels euh, des bulletins spéciaux d'alerte et des notes de décideurs. Et nous euh, avons aussi un système d'information sur euh, d'information régionale d'information pastorale qui diffuse les informations dérivées euh, des données d'observateurs d'observation de la terre aux utilisateurs à la base. Diapo suivant, s'il vous plaît. Diapo suivant, oh, merci. Donc, au nombre de ces services, vous avez aussi des services tels que services culture, services pastoralisme, services euh, sécheresse, services irrigation, et services inondation. Les feux de brousse, vous avez, on a vu qu'il y aura des améliorations substantielles en termes de détection de feux. Ça, ça c'est vraiment une bonne chose. Nous avons le cadre, le cadre harmonisé qui permet d'évaluer les populations et, et, et vulnérables, vulnérables à travers une intégration de ces, de, les services que nous développons. Nous avons aussi cette, cette question de la cartographie euh, de l'occupation et de l'utilisation des terres pour le suivi et l'évaluation de, de la restauration des forêts et paysages. Suivant, s'il vous plaît. Diapo suivant. Alors, euh, quelles sont les améliorations euh, des services et des applications que nous attendons Eh bien, nous attendons, en tout cas, euh, de ce que nous avons vu à travers le MEDSA troisième génération, euh, d'avoir une amélioration de la qualité de l'information dérivée de de la terre, notamment sur l'état phénologique des cultures, l'estimation des productions agricoles, la prévision des rendements, la cartographie des superficies emblavées. Nous attendons aussi une amélioration de la qualité des données pour que nous puissions en tout cas avoir des variables des prédicteurs assez, assez pertinents et intéressants, plus fiables pour la prévision des rendements agricoles, fourragères, les, les, le, les, les inondations et la chesseresse. Nous souhaiterions aussi, en tout cas, que euh, ça nous permettrait d'avoir une meilleure identification des feux actifs. Là, je suis plus que rassuré. Une amélioration aussi de la cartographie de l'aide des états de surface pour une mise à l'échelle des bonnes pratiques pour la restauration des forêts et, et paysages. Et ainsi que l'amélioration de nos services que nous avons nommés tantôt. Suivant, s'il vous plaît. En termes de bénéfices socio-économiques, nous attendons Diapo suivant, s'il vous plaît. En termes de bénéfices socio-économiques, je disais tantôt que nous attendons une amélioration de la production agricole à travers une meilleure planification des, des, des actions, une optimisation des, des périodes d'apport des pesticides et même des engrais. Nous attendons comme bénéfice aussi la réduction de l'exode rural, la transhumance apaisée, la réduction des conflits entre les agriculteurs et les éleveurs. Je pense que vous avez un peu avancé sur les diapos, mais vous pouvez rester là-bas. Nous voulons aussi garantir, on pense qu'on peut garantir un revenu pour les agriculteurs grâce à la mise en place d'une assurance agricole contre les effets néfastes du changement climatique. Pour pour finir, je dirais, en tout cas, pour que tout cela soit 
il est important qu'il y ait de la, du renforcement des capacités des techniciens des pays et de la région à l'utilisation des données d'observation de la Terre. Il est important aussi euh, de renforcer les capacités en intelligence artificielle pour euh, la surveillance de l'environnement, le traitement et l'analyse des images satellitaires, l'impact de la CCRS sur l'agriculture et les ressources naturelles, ainsi que la modernisation de l'agriculture. Troisième moment, nous pensons qu'il y a une nécessité pour y arriver d'améliorer l'accès à Internet et notre capacité de stockage des données. Et enfin, nous pensons qu'il faut assurer la continuité de l'accès à l'électricité par le renforcement des capacités en énergie solaire pour assurer la continuité des acquisitions des données d'observation de la terre. Voici en gros ce que j'avais à vous présenter. Je vous remercie et je suis à votre disposition pour des éventuelles questions. Merci. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Garba. So next is Dr. Arthur Ngulai, the director of ICPAC. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Zachary Adero. I will be representing uh, the Dr. Tan, who could not join us due to an event of circumstance. Uh, next, please. Uh, okay. Uh, ICPAC uh, was started actually as Drought Monitoring Center for Eastern Africa. Uh, and uh, this was a uh, WMO project and uh, in uh, here 207 it was adopted as a specialized institution of EGAND. Now also uh, in May 2017 we became a regional WMO regional center. Uh, we have partnership with many institutions, uh, UMETSAT, uh, GRC, among others. Uh, and our actual mission is to co uh, foster climate services for community resilience in the Great Town of Africa. Next. Our services, we mainly our services are uh, we offer climate services, monitoring, prediction, and we tailor information for many applications. The key being uh, agriculture, uh, water resources, disaster risk management, among others. Next. Uh, yeah, uh, we know very well in our region, uh, hydrometeorological hazards. Uh, contribute to about 90% uh, uh, of uh, disasters. Here we have like severe weather, uh, flash floods, landslides, uh, river floods, droughts, among others. Those are issues we need to address and uh, uh, we are addressing currently and uh, we use both the meteorological data and the satellite data to undertake the applications. Next. Yeah, these are some of applications of uh, uh, climate information, uh, satellite applications in our region. Uh, you know very well, since Puma, uh, ICPAC has been uh, applying uh, satellite information. Uh, we have Puma station, uh, even Apple grade, and then uh, E-station or Mesa station. Uh, recently, we installed the RAS station uh, through a uh, EU funded project on Sawidra, uh, through a command. Uh, this will help very much in uh, accessing high resolution satellite data uh, for severe weather forecasting uh, in applications uh, in disaster risk management. 
we also do crop monitoring uh, and uh, even just at locust uh, monitoring and prediction because we know the desert locusts mainly uh, depend on uh, wind speed direction and uh, we offer that service for the region where we uh, provide the possible location of uh, uh, or movement of the desert locusts in our region next uh, what are we expecting really from that the generation uh, meters at that generation satellite we know of course we will have more data uh, more resolution uh, for precipitation and the precipitation rate for numerical weather prediction we know when the uh, data is being assimilated to numerical weather prediction we will have more of the data for that the wind data will improve on our desert locust uh, prediction uh, and uh, in overall, uh, these will better services for disaster risk management in our region. Uh, uh, next, next, next. Yeah, we know very well uh, the MTG and the SADAI framework for disaster risk uh, reduction, uh, the four priority areas, understanding disaster risk, strengthening disaster risk and governance to manage disaster risk, investing in disaster reduction for resilience, enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response, and to build better, uh, back better in recovery. And we know also it will contribute to Paris Agreement. Uh, we know very well priority two on the resilience of community, livelihood and ecosystems, which is also in line with uh, our Idris Initiative, uh, uh, which uh, our vision in Uganda is to have risk, resilient communities, ecosystems by year 2027. And we think uh, the MTG will contribute greatly to this. Of course, also there is early warning systems and uh, early preparedness. Next. Uh, this is what already I've said. But uh, in conclusion, I can say that. Uh, for disaster risk management, uh, the EGAN Summit has approved the setting up of uh, a disaster operations center at ICPAC. As currently, we host uh, the EGAN disaster management program. We also uh, host at ICPAC the EGAN uh, food security and nutrition area. area the analysis unit, uh, which we call IFRA, uh, with the setting up of uh, the Disaster Operations Center at ICPAC, we will greatly benefit from MTG because uh, the now casting of severe weather, which will be improved, uh, the lightning imager, uh, detecting also and monitoring of uh, fires, will constitute a critical component of. Uh, disaster operations center that will be we are now currently setting up and uh, by the time uh, the mtg is launched in become operational in 2023 the disaster uh, operation center of iga and will be operational at Park, and we expect to benefit greatly from this initiative thank you very much thanks a lot for your presentation so we're going to hear a summary from all this from Mr. Andre Basole, who is an expert at Serpinet. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mimi. Good morning, everybody. My name is Andre Basole, and I'm going to make this presentation on behalf of uh, the GSAT team which is coordinated by Mr. Emilio Barizano with the contribution of uh, the contribution of uh, Elvi, uh, who is our expert in uh, satellites. Okay, my slide is here, so we can go to the next. Thank you very much. 
As a summary of what we heard and what we saw from the uh, previous three, the three last presentations, we could uh, identify four key areas of interest that have been uh, mentioned. The first one is the fulfillment of institutional mandates. And uh, we also saw that most of the uh, institutions are expecting technical efficiency enhancements from the MTG and the EPSSG uh, operation in Africa. Then we also heard a lot about the social and economic impact that is expected. And finally, uh, we also heard about um, influence on policy change, uh, taking this opportunity as a long-term process that is starting. Next, please. I'm not going to spend time on this slide. I just want to mention something very important that is, has not been stressed enough is the fact that moving from MSG to MTG and from EPS to EPSSG is going to be a big change, a big qualitative, qualitative change in the services that will be delivered. But we will come back to this uh, in more detail in the coming slides. Next, please. Let me say a few words about uh, the MTG uh, EPSSG Africa impact, socioeconomic impact study. It has been initiated by MSAT in conformity with its commitment to continue serving the earth system user communities and particularly those of Africa. The main objective of this uh, uh, study was to evaluate the socioeconomic potential of MTG and EPSSG for the African users with two specific objectives, taking MSG and EPS as a benchmark. The first specific objective was to develop a framework and a methodology and common terminology for articulating the socioeconomic benefits. And the second one was to provide high level assessment of the expected socioeconomic benefits. Next, please. As a scope of the study, uh, we focused on three priority sectors. And these are agriculture, disaster risk reduction, and air navigation. A group of four institutions, regional institutions in Africa that we call the user reference group was involved in this uh, study. And we like to take the opportunity to thank Agrimet, ACMAD, ICPAC, and ASECNA who really contributed to the success of this uh, study. The main objective undertaken um, can be summarized as, as follows. We uh, undertook a theoretical analysis that was uh, now uh, checked in the field through uh, a, a survey involving these uh, institutions I mentioned. Then the outcome of this survey was uh, processed and the uh, two sources of uh, the independent source of analysis were confronted and we came up with some results that are, have been consolidated as a conclusion for this study. Next, please. So talking about uh, results, uh, this slide provides you with uh, one first result. Uh, looking at the three priority sectors that we identified, we were able to spot and uh, define 11 services that are expected from uh, MTG and EPSSG. These are the ones listed in the first column. 
Now, we also went further to evaluate, actually to compute, the level of improvement expected for each of these services. I must mention that 10 of the, the 11 are already uh, available from MSG and EPS. So the 11, that's the 11th, the, the, the last one is a new uh, service provided by expected from the new satellite system coming. And now, if you look at the, uh, the three last columns, you would notice that you have figures there. These figures represent the level of improvement that is expected for each of the 11 services. If we take, for example, uh, the case of uh, the first one, which is just crop monitoring, um, the crop monitoring service, you will see that we expect from the agricultural area that uh, the increase will be in the range of 98% to 312% uh, increase. And this is very important to notice because it means that uh, really it's not a small increment that will occur when we move from MSG to MTG and from EPS to EPSSG, but really a big chunk. Next, please. Um, in terms of uh, socioeconomic benefits, we went on to take every service and look into the type of socioeconomic services, uh, benefits that can be um, expected. In this regard, we, I'll just uh, take a, a, again the example of the first, that is the crop condition monitoring. You see there that uh, uh, there is a, an emerging, uh, emerging um, application that is coming up in Africa, and that is the uh, climate insurance against climate risks in agriculture. So, for example, in this case, we can expect a direct uh, benefit, a direct monetary benefit from the fact that insurance companies will have to compensate for the losses uh, due to uh, weather uh, conditions on uh, the crops. And you have a series of other uh, socioeconomic benefits and the detail is available uh, through the report of this study. Next, please. Let me go to the conclusion, main conclusion uh, in the area of agriculture. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I just mentioned, there is this new uh, emerging uh, area of interest, and that is the insurance against climate-related risk uh, to agric agriculture. So there is a need in Africa to adapt policies and strategies at a national level so that uh, we build capacity to really use the, the data provided by EPS, uh, MTG and EPS SG. And these uh, data uh, you saw from the uh, uh, presentation made by ASECNA, uh, they said they want to move to make the meteorological information a credible uh, information. And this is the area where the credibility will be proved because these data uh, provided by the satellites will be used as a proof that compensation is uh, valid for those who suffer from uh, the impact of uh, severe weather. We also need institutions that should play this key role of uh, uh, authoritative institution that can give a certification of the validity of that information on the basis of which you know the compensation will be made and of course we need uh, from our governments uh, incentives so that uh, financial institutions invest into this new area and finally we need uh, 
to build the capacity and uh, bring the uh, national judiciary systems to be aware of this uh, change and to be ready to sit and look into cases where necessary uh, in the application of this new uh, insurance uh, policies. Next, please. In the domain, domain of disaster risk uh, uh, reduction, uh, we, we, we saw that, uh, we showed in this study that uh, the level of improvement is very significant uh, in the domain of disaster risk reduction. And this is a great opportunity for uh, African leaders and uh, the experts to boost uh, the quality and to enhance uh, the operationalization of uh, their DRR early warning systems uh, in, in Africa. Next, please. Uh, about air navigation, uh, we saw uh, from the technical presentations that a specific new service is dedicated to air navigation, and that is the lightning. I'm not uh, going to spend time on that. And we have also uh, uh, notice that there is a great level of improvement that is expected for air navigation, air transport routing weather forecast uh, service, where we are expecting to move from 250% increase to 269%. Uh, so the policy makers, uh, we think they have here the possibility to improve the efficiency of Africa's air safety uh, particularly by uh, supporting the AFCAC to implement the Abuja safety targets and uh, by creating also the required conditions for uh, the expected uh, level of improvement to be really materialized into socioeconomic benefits. Next, please. Finally, we have uh, two great messages for uh, the African leader, uh, leaders. The first one being that we are facing, we are going to move into an important potential of improvement in terms of capacity, availability of quality data uh, for with the advent of MTG and EPS SG. And this uh, requires uh, really uh, full attention because as I said before, it is not just an incremental uh, change. It is three times improved. That is go, it can go up to four times uh, increase compared to what we are uh, experiencing right now with MSG and EPS. And the second message is uh, that uh, the policy, the leaders in Africa should do the best to uh, play their key role by putting in place uh, an appropriate policy framework. And that policy framework will allow to build and sustain the institutional human and technological capacity of Africa to take the best advantage of this uh, new opportunity and also to leapfrog on the Agenda 2063 roadmap with uh, the contribution and thanks to uh, MTG and EPS SG operation over our continent. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation, Mr. Basole. We've now come to our last presentation of the morning from Marianne diop Kane, the Senior Officer at the AMCOMAT Secretariat. And she's gonna have a presentation about the initial concept for an MTG AMSAF program. Madam Kane, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mimi. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to uh, present you on behalf of the Joint Working Group of the Abidjan Declaration, the initial concept for uh, MTG AMSAF program. Being the last speaker is uh, we, will be quite straightforward and easy to present the concept once you've heard since morning the opportunities and challenges with MTG. Next slide, please. 
So MTG will be soon launched and data will be available from 2023 to 2040. And we need a continuity from MSG, you heard it since morning. MTG will offer a lot of capabilities. You heard it since morning, you're going to have a lightning image, an improved time and special resolution. You're going to have data every 10 minutes and a resolution for a uh, special resolution of uh, one kilometer, one kilometer and even less in the visible. We're gonna have then a, an exponential growth of the data from 1.5 megabit per second to 35. What are you going to do with all of the data? Africa need to be prepared. You've seen that um, uh, you'll be able to monitor better the atmosphere. The wind will be better represented. Convection will be better monitored and lightning will be having it, you've heard it. So we need to make priorities. And this discussion has been going on with RADEC since 2016. And at that time, even uh, RADEC did uh, uh, make strong recommendation during the user forum that we needed to have an increased capacity in Africa, both human and infrastructure. It will be uh, the Africans will need to be able to access the data, understand them, and have uh, space to store them, have the infrastructure to process the data. And you heard this morning that even with MSG, we are not uh, uh, using all of the data. So for MTG, which are going to give us at least 30 times more data with much more capabilities, we need to get really prepared for that. Next slide, please. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Oh, okay, thank you, yeah. Okay, so after those recommendations in 2016 to increase the capacity of uh, Africans to be able to uh, get uh, MTG data, we've come up with an Abidjan declaration, which has been signed on the 24th of September, 2018, by the Minister of Transport of Côte d'Ivoire, the AMCOMET chair, the AU commissioner, and the Rex. And this Abidjan declaration has been endorsed by AMCOMET and the AU C Specialized Technical Committee. Next, please. The Abidjan declaration. Next, please. So the Abidjan declaration, in brief, encourage and support the strengthening of African capacities to ensure a smooth transition to MTG. We shouldn't have a break gap between MSG to MTG. It will be disastrous because these uh, are the only uh, tools and facilities the national med services are using to um, deliver their forecasting products, their weather and climate services. So we need to ensure a smooth transition to MTG. The Abidjan Declaration further strengthen, requires to strengthen the African capacities in satellite meteorology by exploring the feasibility and developing and establishing an, um, an African Meteorological Satellite Application Facility, AMSAF, as those SAF that exist in Europe. So for more than decades, we've heard it, we've been receiving, Africa has been receiving products from UMATSAT. So it's high time for uh, Africans to be able to process their own adapted products, satellite products for their users. So uh, this declaration encourages the development uh, of the capacity of Africans to be able to develop such products. And further, the Afri Abidjan Declaration um, requested to engage with EU to put an MTG and AMSAF in the joint EU-Africa strategy, and that we are working on it, and further develop an action and constitute a working group to monitor and facilitate the implementation of this declaration. Next slide, please. 
So the Abidjan Declaration has been presented at the AMCOMAT for session in Cairo by the Côte d'Ivoire representative. And the Cairo Declaration requested AUC to establish the joint working group that had been done since October 2019. And the members of the joint working group are AUC, which is the chair, the regional economic commissions, including IOC and OMA, with their technical expert. And Radek sit in the committee. And we agreed on the terms of reference and uh, the roadmap. Since the joint working group met uh, five times even, because we met uh, uh, recently this year, and agreed on an initial concept for an MTG AMSAF program. Next slide, please. So the initial concept has an overall, overall objective to support the sustainable development of Africa in all socioeconomic sectors through the provision of climate and weather services with no breakdown. And to strengthen the African capacities to access meteorological and climate satellite data and to deliver through innovative products and services, adequate information for decision makers in various socioeconomic sectors. Next slide, please. So we, the um, concept have seven outputs summarized in the schematic. The so first output for data access. This output ensures that Africans have access to data, satellite data, to MTG data with no interruption. Output two, on the data processing and infrastructure, they are able to receive the data, to process, process them, have the equipment and tools to visualize them and develop the products needed for their users. Output three is a new one. This is the establishment of AMSAF to make sure that the African have, have now the facility have now the capacity to develop their own products, products that are uh, adapted, that are uh, be um, evaluated for their own needs and for the reality of Africa. Output four, as the Africans have the ability, the capacity to develop services, all services to socioeconomic sectors. And output five, through uh, strengthening of policy frameworks and knowledge sharing throughout Africa and even uh, from the developing developed countries in Europe. And output six and seven are enablers and we put a strong focus on this capacity building and research development, which is very important to be able to really develop the uh, tailored products for all users and also have the critical mass uh, of African being trained on satellite uh, meteorology to be able to develop the um, uh, products that are needed for their users. Next slide, please. So as, as uh, uh, projects that you heard in the morning from Puma, Ames to um, Mesa, uh, this concept will be uh, developed through a thematic approach. And uh, we've been dis discussing with the Rex through the um, joint working group, and they've indicated their priorities for the region. So we agreed on eight thematic uh, application. Thema one, transport. Thema two, agriculture and pastoralism. Thema three, environment. Thema four, energy. Thema five, the blue economy. Uh, Thema six, desertification land degradation and drought, thema seven, disaster risk reduction, and thema five, health, including air pollution. And this thema will be implemented through implementation centers that are going to be selected for each region and each thema, as has been this case for the previous program. Each thema will include 
regional and national networks, which will develop sets of services and products for their users in the region. Next slide, please. So for this um, uh, initial concept had been presented during the last uh, AMCOMED session that took place uh, on the 17th of March. And this session um, uh, appreciated the, uh, um, the progress made into the implementation of the Abidjan Declaration and further uh, requested AUC and uh, the Regional Economic Commission to continue their efforts in, uh, mobi in mo mobilizing resources so that uh, Africa get ready for MTG. Uh, MTG, as we said, we've been saying it since morning, uh, data will start being available from 23, 2023, hopefully, and we shouldn't be having any break up. And in this concept, what is new and what is very important is the capacity building that, uh, and uh, the capacity building, the research uh, and is innovation that are going to be put in place this time to ensure that Africans now have the capacity to develop their own products in a sustainable way. Thank you for your attention. I will stop there. Thank you very much for your presentation. So now we're gonna have a very, very short Q&A with only one question because we've gone a bit over time. So the question we've chosen is from Madagascar and it asks MTG satellite series will always be placed over the zero degree longitude. Like MET, IODC is very beneficial for Indian Ocean communities with broader coverage area. And I'll pose this question to Vincent. Yes, first of all, thank you, uh, Mimi, and thank you all to all uh, people who raised questions. Um, we will answer all questions also during the next break, uh, either uh, uh, in written in Slido, but there was quite a lot of questions related to training and equipment, and this will be answered in the afternoon session. So I beg for your patience uh, for uh, getting answered to most of, of the questions raised uh, this morning. Regarding the questions on uh, IODC, so for the moment, MTG will be uh, located at zero degrees and will provide the same coverage as Metosat second generation, currently the Metosat 9, by example. But we will, there is plan at UMESA to continue having Metosat second generation over the Indian Ocean, at least for the next uh, seven or eight uh, years. So the current uh, Metosat 8 will continue until the end of next year. And then we are planning to move Metosat 9 over the Indian Ocean as soon as MTG is available at zero degree. Uh, there is still some a bit of unknown and risk related that if um, the deployment of MTG is delayed or if there is any uh, difficulties uh, in ensuring the zero degree service, uh, that we will have to prioritize between zero degree and IODC. But currently we are quite confident and the plan is to continue uh, coverage of the Indian Oceans with METOS at second generation uh, for the for the next um, uh, five, six, seven, eight years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. So we've come to an end of the first session now. Now we're going to have a lunch break until 12 UTC or 14 hours Central European uh, summertime. I want to thank everybody for your participation for your participation and all the speakers for their presentations. And we also encourage you to post about this event on social media. So the hashtags are also in the chat and I'm looking forward to see you later in the afternoon for our second session, which is going to focus on MTG mission, data access and training in Africa. See you later, goodbye. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome back to the second session of this webinar and it's going to focus more on the MTG mission, data access and training in Africa. So if you want to post about the event, you can use the hashtag EOAfrica or at UMATSAT. And it's very important to use the Slido tool for any questions you have today. So if your question is answered during the webinar itself, it's gonna be answered during the day afterwards whenever you visit the Slido page. So first a short rundown for our agenda for the remaining agenda. 
So right now, just the welcome, and afterwards, we're going to be uh, graced by two um, presentations from Duni Faya. Uh, yeah, MTG System Specialist Projects Coordinator in the Geo Program Division here at UMATSAT. And after that, we're going to have a presentation from Stefan Pulinski, working in the, as an MTG User Preparation Project Manager in User Support and Climate Surface Division. And after that, we're going to have a short Q&A session. After that, we're going to give the floor to Sally Warnock, the Use Relations Manager. And after that, we're going to have our last presentation from Vincent Gabardio, an International Relations Officer in Strategy and Communications. So after this, I'm ready to give the floor to Duny Faya. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you enter full screen mode? So I'm going to present the FCI data for Africa, the main characteristic, characteristic of them. This morning you had an overview. Now I'm going a bit more in details. Next. I will address uh, which, what is the, public tar the targeted public of this presentation. I will address the MSG continuity of improvement, which is the MSTG imaging. For the dissemination, I will present the challenge, the summary, and the differences. I will focus on FCI level 1C. I will address the RGB, whether they are local or central. I will mention the FCI level 2, and I will draw some conclusion of this meeting. So first, to clarify, this presentation is to provide an overview of MTG-specific aspect for UMATCAST Africa, which means for the user who are relying exclusively on, MTG, on UMATCAST Africa. It is not targeting the user which are located in the North Africa because they benefit of UMATCAST Europe, or it's not targeting users which are connected to UMATCAST Terrestrial, which concern only a few users. This slide you saw so it this morning, you can see that Africa is at the center of MTG uh, and center of observation of imaging. A quick uh, reminder as well. So uh, the showing on the left uh, what we are obtaining with MSG, showing on the right what we can obtain uh, with MTG. So you can see a net difference for a true color prod RGB product. This was taken. Uh, so on the right is not MTG, of course, it's modis, but with similar characteristics as MTG. So it is what we expect. So definitely you will see that MTG is an improvement compared to MSG. Another example of the current situation on the left with MEG theory and of what we expect on the right uh, for MTG, like MODIS. In that case, it is the Botswana. It is detecting and monitoring files in Botswana. So we'll have higher spatial and temporal resolution. We'll have a more sensitive 3.9 micro micrometer channel and a new 2.2 micrometer channel, which will improve, which will allow for improved fire detection. Concerning the imager itself, uh, we are moving from 11, 12 channel, 11 full disk ch channel and uh, the 12 channel, which was a band, uh, moved twice a day to a 16 channel solution from TGI, from TGI with a full disk for all of them. This scanning will be more frequent, 10 minutes instead of 15 minutes. It will still be a scanning uh, from south to north, uh, but alternating as you can see in this animation. The dynamic will be increased. We'll have a 12-bit resolution instead of having a 10-bit uh, dynamic for the, for the measurement. And we will have, a, uh, we will move from a three by three kilometers to one resolution to one by one kilometer for the visible channels or two by two kilometers for the infrared channels. So here you can see what we have 12 channels existing on MEG. They are kept more or less, roughly kept. Sometimes there is a small adjustment. And we are adding next five channels, which are the ones shown by the arrows and the green square, which are specific to MTG. So these are the difference between the 12 channels and the 16 channels between MSG and MTG. Here you have another example of what we could do with MTG with the higher resolution of MTG which provides, in that case, we are here, we're observing files in the USA uh, by the GOES satellite, but again, similar to what should be able to do MTG. 
And you can see that MTG will allow to pinpoint more precisely uh, the files. And we have a better resolution and better discrimination, which was uh, a bit of a weakness of the MSG satellite. So it will be a better decision tool for the emergency service. But all, the, all has a price, and we have a dissemination challenge. Uh, we are moving, if we are just taking MSG compared to MTG, we are moving from a system which was a few megabit per second to a system which is several hundreds of megabit per second. So we will have some bandwidth limitation, which will prevent, unfortunately, the user of Humedcast Africa to receive all the product. So in order to find, uh, but we we work a lot with Red Egg and uh, to find the best solution and to find the best uh, approach or compromise. And we have decided to reduce the space sampling, to reduce the sampling frequency of a number of channels disseminated and to do geographical crop in order to save bandwidth with a target of ending around four megabit per second. So we, we through, through the last year, during the last years, we discussed with Red Egg and we prioritize the continuity of the benefit achieved today with MSG while introducing some MTG innovation. And this discussion with Red Egg have been blessed by the UMEDSAT Council at the, at, the end of last, at, this, at the end of last year. Uh, there is also a challenge which is on the infrastructure. The data access capacity needs to be increased. If we receive more bandwidth compared to MEG to, to receive data, you, you need also more storage, you need also equipment which are more powerful in order to process the data. Which means that if the RF part of the station can be kept as is, the dish and the RF part, the equipment to process the data, which is, which is for example, in the Puma station, will need to be upgraded and the software will need to be modified to visualize the data. So you cannot, with the existing station, uh, observe or monitor or receive the MTG data. It will be also a challenge for the personnel, which will have to be trained on the new data, which will have to be trained on the new product, on the way to use them in operational service, whether it is for downcasting or for forecasting or for aviation. And we should not forget the training and the maintenance and the system administration of this reception station. Here I'm summarizing the base, what we call the baseline of a distribution baseline. So in a nutshell, what we are disseminating or what we will disseminate via UMED South Africa will include the 16 MTG FCI channels at the MSG resolution, three by three kilometers, but with coverage and periodicity of channels tuned to the needs. I will come back to that later on. On top of that, and new compared to MSG, we will disseminate four centrally produced RGB uh, products with a one by one kilometer resolution and a tailored coverage to save bandwidth. We will provide the true color RGB at three by three kilometers of a full disk. It's also new compared to MSG. We'll provide the continuity of the HRV channels at one by one kilometer of Africa. In the past, it was a band which was shifted twice a day, east, west, and then west, east. Now it will be the full Africa at one by one kilometer. So a significant improvement compared to MSG. We'll have also a new product called the Lightning Accumulated Flash Area, which will which should be very, I will come back to that. It's, uh, it should be very interesting for the users. We have a five level two product, which will be far improved compared to MSG, thanks to a channel, to the five channels, which has a better resolution than the MSG one. We'll disseminate a subset of a SAF level two product, including a subset of an outcasting SAF, but the exact subset has not yet been decided. And we'll disseminate the Global Instability Index GII product, level two product. There is growth potential should more bandwidth become available, either to improve periodicity or coverage for the level one channels, or to add a subset of the optical cloud analysis product, or to have more soft product. This is conferable, can be added if more bandwidth become available. I mentioned that the coverage was tailored to the needs in order to save the bandwidth. If we, if we disseminate, for example, the full disk except South America, we are saving 5% of the bandwidth. 
if we are disseminating the whole Africa plus uh, a band around uh, the coast, we are already saving 50% of the bandwidth. In that case, the band is uh, 1,600 kilometers uh, wide. And if we are disseminating only the sub-Africa and only the land part, we are saving 80% of the bandwidth. So this cropping has dramatically reduced the dissemination bandwidth. And we have decided, or the REDEG made the recommendation to go for it and to tune this cropping for each channel depending on its usage. For example, very easy, the, the five channels is more useful over land than over sea. And to do cropping as well for each RGB product, except the, the true color, which will be over the full disk. This tailoring will be made, taking into account the usage of the channel or the usage of this RGB, the application areas. It will consist in a static array of true false Boolean per pixel. So for each pixel, we indicate whether it is transmitted or not. It will be configurable even during commissioning operation. If we have more bandwidth or if we realize that we should improve a bit the coverage here or, or whatever, we can modify it during the life of a satellite. All the details are available in the document called Africa Product User Guide, uh, which is available on the UMEDSAT website. And all the sizing of each product uh, is available in this document. Coming back to the FCI Level 1C product, the, they will be tuned for, to ensure MSG continuity. It was a request from, from a Red Egg meeting with an introduction of some MTG innovation. To achieve that, we, as I said before, we are tuning the coverage and periodicity of each channel according to the need. And uh, the example of the coverage as before, only land, sub sahara full disk, and so on, is the picture that you saw before. And this saving in terms of bandwidth will allow to introduce the MTG new channels what I call including MTG innovation in order for getting familiarized with these new channels in order to determine if we can make something useful for, with them on over Africa. The big difference between MSG and MTG is that MTG is at 10 minutes when MSG is at uh, 15 minutes. So we will, the MSG-like channels will be disseminated every 10 minutes instead of every 15 minutes except the water vapor 6.3 and 7.3, which will be disseminated every 20 minutes. The reason is that they, are, they present a slower evolution. So the 10 minutes was not an advantage. Again, saving a factor two on the bandwidth for these two channels. The new channels from MTG, the four new channels of MTG, will also be disseminated, but with a lower frequency and with reduced coverage in order to get familiarized with them. And the spe special sampling distance will be three by three kilometers, like MSG, answering MSG continuity. The HRV continuity will be improved compared to MSG as well, with a permanent Africa coverage, when for MSG it was a band, uh, north-south band shifted twice a day. On top of this, and this is new for MTG, we will disseminate five uh, centrally generated RGB. So these centrally generated RGB are generated inside UMEDSAT with a full uh, quality and are disseminated with appropriate uh, coverage and the appropriate periodicity. So typically, we will have a night macrophysics, which allows to detect fog and low clouds. We we'll have a so-called uh, true color on the full disk. We we'll have severe convection to, to monitor storms. We'll have a five temperature RGB, which will be complemented by a level two uh, product, and the combination of the two will help to uh, the, the corresponding service to uh, and we have the so-called cloud phase RGB. We will have uh, so we'll have uh, for the level two of FCI, we'll have a so-called native five product, the same as over Europe, with a complete half disk at 10 minutes and uh, every two kilometers with a grid of two kilometers, map on a grid of two kilometers. And this native fire product combined with the RGB that you have just seen before should be an help for the appropriate service fighting the fire. 
will disseminate a subset of a GII at 10, 10 minutes and 6 meters. Uh, it's a subset, but what is disseminated is a true product without uh, degradation, which will, will help uh, for convection. And as I mentioned, we'll have, uh, I have a placeholder for the SAF. It remains to be agreed with Redec what we disseminate. I think there was a question this morning about uh, the, mo the model, what are the input for the model? The ASR, CRM, and CLM models are input for, for the models, but they are not disseminated by UMATCAST Africa. They should be received via other means, typically UMATCAST terrestrial. But this concerns only a few centers, and this we have to find other solutions for these few centers. And if one day we have more bandwidth, we could add, for example, optimal cloud analysis, which contains the essential uh, cloud mask information. Okay. Yeah. Now, in terms of uh, conclusions, uh, UMATCAST Africa remains the primary dissemination means for users in Africa, which are below sub sahara The users in Africa, in, uh, in the Maghreb area and the North Africa, have access to UMATCAST uh, Europe. UMATCAST Astriol will provide to some data having the capacity to be connected uh, more data but it requires either good internet connectivity or a connection to the NREN network. And we, we are perfectly aware that only a few users can have access to this network and good internet connectivity. So this is why we continue with the UMATCAST Africa service for all the other users who do not have access to these two networks. The Africa UMATSAT baseline recommended by REDECT has been approved by UMATSAT Council, except this TBD concerning uh, the, the SAF, but there is no, it's just a question of agreeing on something. There is no dispute on that. Uh, all this distribution baseline is precisely detailed in the document called MTGDIS, which is available on the UMSAT website. This dissemination of Africa is highly optimized in terms of bandwidth, in terms of compression, coverage, periodicity. More data could be disseminated if more bandwidth could become available in the future. We could tune the coverage and periodicity according to the need in the future to if the needs evolve or if we badly uh, uh, recognize the need or if we have more bandwidth in the future. So it means that the, rec the reception station must be flexible to this sort of change by software. This Africa distribution baseline is documented in details in the document called Africa Product User Guide, which is also available on the website. The continuity of the nowcasting SAF product will be implemented by processing centrally this uh, nowcasting SAF and distributed the tailor subset of its product. And last but not least, and you can go to the next slide, you are invited to the FCI webinar plan on the 8th to the 10th of June, which will tell you everything that you want to know on the FCI. Later on, we have a question and answer session. I can, I will be happy to answer in French or English as you prefer. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mr. Fayard. So next on the agenda is the co-presentation of Mr. Stefan Boyinski and Bartolomeo Vitiki. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. We can hear you, thank you. Great. Um, so yes, this is a, pre a presentation. Myself, Bartolome Vitiquier. Here we have it as LI team leader. Sorry, this is LI science team leader. Uh, yes, that I have. Uh, we have prepared in cooperation with Stefan Boczynski. Uh, please, next slide. So just a very quick introduction on uh, the type of signal where we are aiming at detecting with the lightning imager. So as we know, a la lightning is a sudden electrostatic discharge between electrically charged region, regions. This could be within a cloud. In that case, we will talk about intra-cloud lightning between two clouds, so cloud to cloud lightnings and uh, uh, between cloud and ground. So the cloud to ground uh, lightning. So, the radiation produced by an electric discharge within or below a cloud reaches the top of a cloud system after multiple scattering through the cloud itself. And it is detected, of course, 
by lightning imagers that are in space in the visible band. So here, um, there is this interesting table uh, put together to kind of contextualize the lightning imager uh, and also to explain why uh, lightning imaging from space is extremely important. So let's focus uh, uh, on, the on the last three rows uh, to begin. So we have VHF, low LF, so low frequency and VLF, very low frequencies detectors. These are three types of ground-based uh, detec uh, detection networks for lightning, of course. As you can see, these have different baselines, uh, meaning they are placed over areas that can cover uh, small regions like VHF detectors or very large regions up to global coverage like VLF uh, detectors. But what is very important to check is actually in the third column where we describe uh, in a very compact way, the detection capabilities of these systems. So as you can see, VHF detector, they have very high detection uh, capabilities. They can actually monitor over very small areas, the complete lightning activity uh, with actually a very localized 3D map mapping of the lightning and electrical activity. But as soon as we move away uh, from, from these local uh, detection capabilities and we want to detect the lightnings from ground over regions like Europe, for example, or, or even over, glo over the, the globe, things change very much. And these uh, systems uh, are then designed to focus much more on cloud to, uh, to ground CG uh, uh, events, as you can see, while uh, intra-cloud and cloud to cloud uh, detections become less and less uh, efficient, okay? So these uh, systems uh, that are worth mentioning are, for example, Euclid, the, the European uh, Cooperation for Lightning Detection, and the Visalat GLU 360, or that covers also Africa, for example. So, but now if we focus on the, on the first row, we have that uh, from, from space in the visible band, we are capable of detecting between 80, 90% of the total lightning activity. So we have detection capabilities that are very close to the, to the ones of the VHF detectors, but over scales of the order of the field of view of geo or Leo missions, so very large uh, scales. Moreover, uh, on top of the coverage, we can get also physical information about the lighting activity. For example, we can get radiance information, so optical emission against the information that are usually related, for example, to peak current uh, when we consider detections from the ground. So, of course, in the first row, we have to mention very important instruments from the past, like OTD or the lighting imaging sensor that is currently flying on the ISS. And of course, the, the GLM, the Geostationary Lighting Mapper that, that is flying since 2016. And this is where our instrument, uh, the MTG Lighting Imager will be uh, sitting uh, and uh, it will be flying since 2022. Next slide, please. So in a nutshell, uh, key design <coughs> aspects of the LI, Special resolution at nadir 4.5 kilometer. This means that within the field of view, the uh, um, special resolution varies. Uh, the spectral band uh, used for the detection is centered around the 777.4 nanometer wavelength as uh, usually from space uh, with a band with the, which is of 1.9 nanometer uh, width. We have, we employ four detectors it's like an instrument which is composed actually by four instruments with these sides, 1000 times 1170 pixels to capture about 84% of the field of view. The frame rate and also onboard processing rate will be of one kilohertz. So this corresponds of course to one millisecond uh, in acquisition time. The LI is characterized by three main uh, onboard processing steps. Uh, two of them are also, for example, available on GLM, the background evaluation and subtraction and lighting detection. And then we have a third uh, onboard processing step, which is which are two stages of onboard filtering. The bandwidth that is gonna be used to downlink data from space is of 30 megabits per second. 
And the manufacturer is uh, Leonardo Italy under the industrial prime contract or Thales Alenia Space France as part of the ESA-led uh, MTG space segment development. The logic with which this instrument will be used is the following. So detect as much as we can fit in the level zero downing bandwidth, and then clean the data, uh, of course, from false events through a sequence of processing steps uh, on ground. The next slide, uh, which uh, this, these actually uh, figures are showing you the coverage of LI. Uh, so this is uh, what, what I was mentioning before, 84% of the uh, geo field of view, combining, of course, the four cameras. And of course, as Denis mentioned, Africa represents a huge portion of the LI field of view. And that's why UMETSAT has a huge interest uh, on lighting observation over Africa through LI. Next slide. So detection principle, uh, this I think is very uh, useful to understand. So let's consider a single pixel of our instrument. Uh, so here we are uh, depicting in a very simple way, a typical measurement from a single pixel of LI. So let's imagine as a genetic imager, we have this uh, sky blue line, which is describing a uh, change of illumination, uh, or for example, or a scene within a pixel, like let's say exposure to cloud, land, and then again cloud, and of course transition from day to night. But what is on top of this uh, typical imaging signal is the lightning signal that here is expressed as uh, these sharp uh, red spikes uh, on, on top of the background. It's like an additional component, of course. Um, so on board, what we do is an evaluation of the sky blue line, the background, to have a removal uh, of this component. And because what we want to end up with, it's only the lighting component that you see here now described after background removal. The background removal is performed uh, through an onboard running average of the images we acquire. Uh, and it is, it, it is actually a very efficient uh, approach because it is also employed by other instruments like LIS or uh, GLM. Then at this step, when we are left with our lightning signal, we perform the detection step. We have a threshold for detection, which is proportional to the background. This is because we know that the main noise source that can produce false events is the radiometric noise that is proportional to the background. And that's why we have a detection threshold, which is proportional to the background. And at this point, we do a comparison for each pixel uh, on a millisecond basis to compare the lightning signal, the red spikes against the threshold. And any of these spikes that uh, are larger than the threshold will be detected, will be, excuse me, kept for further processing and then of course detected. Um, and uh, also here, what we can understand is how our detection capabilities will change between day and night, because at night, our scene will be totally dark since we are using a visible imager and our threshold will be very low. So we will be able to detect much uh, fainter lightning compared to the day. So, but at this point we have to clarify, uh, everything we have described so far is a very, uh, let's say, realistic picture of uh, lightning detection because com uh, combined with the real lightning, we will have a lot of transients that are actually generated by uh, noise. As you can see in this uh, bottom left, uh, slightly larger plot, we will have a combination of true detected transients, DTs, and false detected transients, uh, okay? So our, uh, let's say, the, the, the following steps of the processing will be aimed at removing the blue component and to keep the red component. The noise sources that we know will create false events are the radiometric noise, as I've mentioned earlier, microvibration of the platform, particle impacting the focal particles, excuse me, impacting the focal plane, sun gleamed, uh, stray light, and, and so on. Next slide, please. So uh, at this point, we can uh, talk about uh, uh, the, I uh, would say, um, key processing elements that are employed uh, through the LI processing chain. We have mentioned the detected transients, DTs. These are of course detected on a pixel basis, as you can see. There is a, uh, in, in this a very simple sketch, something very important to explain is that LI has the capability 
only for processing purposes, not to populate the products, to retain the a three by three window, pixel window around the detection. So this is information that is going to be useful and crucial uh, through the filtering step. So these events are the basic component of the optical pulse that the LI will be capable of detecting. And these are the uh, key, comp the basic component of the data processing from level zero to level two. When we reach level two, then we introduce a new concept, uh, the concept of groups. Uh, these are collection of these red detected transients appearing together in the same frame and uh, close to each other. Okay, so these are connected detected transients on a single acquisition frame. And this is actually representing uh, an optical pulse detected by LI in one frame, of course. And groups are defined and analyzed at level two. Next slide, please. And then uh, the last element we want to introduce, flashes. Uh, here we, we, we introduce a spatiotemporal correlation between groups. And as you can see here, Flashes are, a, 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 let's say, the purpose of describing multiple pulses that are correlated in space and time, as in these uh, flash provided to, uh, by, uh, to us by uh, the ISS list over one second and a half, about one second and a half. So the purpose of flashes is actually to organize together these pulses, so these groups that appear to be correlated in space and time. And the, the, the flashes are actually a key element for defining the products that we will disseminate in Africa. Next slide, please. So at this point, we can introduce actually the <clears throat> products that will be the product that will be disseminated in Africa. So the accumulated flash area, as mentioned earlier by Denis. So uh, if we consider uh, a single flash as composed by many groups, as uh, as we have here in this uh, diagram, we we can combine this information to actually have on the LI, for example, uh, pixel grid, this extension of this flash, okay? The a single flash will count one in this product, but of course, if there will be more flashes happening on top of it, these will add up on top and we will get numbers that are integers, but higher than one, of course. This information then will be brought on the FCI grid, because of course, this is an extremely important step to have our data uh, comparable and uh, uh, easy to overlay on top of FCI data. The next uh, slide, please. So the service provided via UMATCAST Africa includes the LI accumulated flash area, which as I've mentioned before, is actually giving us uh, an idea of how our flashes will appear in the field of view and how they will accumulate on top of each other in time. So um, we will deliver information on location and special extension of lighting flashes. As I've mentioned before, we have the capabilities of mapping the area of a single flash and then of course of multiple flashes too. We will use as a final grid for presenting our data a two by two kilometer grid, the same used for FCI data. The products will be available every 30 seconds. And something which is very important to stress, we don't have time to explain uh, the analysis we have done to assess the pre-flight uh, uh, performances of LI, but the average flash detection efficiency over Africa uh, for LI is gonna be actually always above 70% and up to 90%, 100% during the night. So if you think that our AFA, the accumulated flash error product is based on flashes, and we have such a good flash detection efficiency, you can understand the potential of this product we are gonna disseminate in Africa. Next slide, please. I did, at this point, uh, excuse me, I leave the floor to Stefan that is gonna talk about uh, some applications of lightning data. Please, Stefan. Thank you, Bart. Um, it's fair to say that as an operational community, we are still learning how to best make use of space-based lightning data. And we are looking here at two examples from the Western Hemisphere where data from the NOAA operated geostationary lightning mapper is being used uh, in uh, visualization operations. So this slide, it has an animation, shows uh, experimental work by the Dutch Met Service uh, from the Netherlands, 
who are responsible for operational forecasting in some Caribbean territories. So you see the South American coast at the bottom and you see some Caribbean islands. What we see here is infrared brightness temperature in color for uh, parts of the cloud that are colder than minus 50 degrees centigrade. And the blue circles show um, flash extent density. So uh, a proxy for the area that is covered by flashes. So if you could click on that picture, please. Right, so the Dutch Med Service was interested in testing processing, reception processing and visualization of this uh, lightning imaging data. And you can see here the convective development in a tropical environment during the night and in the morning where in the infrared imagery from uh, the ABI, the spectral imager, you have the familiar cloud features with the lightning mapping, you get additional information for forecasting the convective development. So the size of these blue circles is proportional to the area that is covered by flashes. And what they have displayed here are all the flashes that have occurred over the past 10 minutes for a forecaster not to get confused by too many signals. So this is one way of uh, displaying and visualizing such lightning data for forecasting. So here you see nicely a new system developing over the Gulf of Venezuela here. This is one example, ex experimental work. We are still trying here in the Dutch Med Service to uh, use to find a best way to use such data. Next slide. Another example from the United States where in the National Weather Service, in the top figure, you have well known radar echoes, which are used for operational forecasting here of a severe thunderstorm over the Alabama area. And of course, this is good intelligence for forecaster to issue severe warning. What gives additional intelligence here is the flash extent product at the bottom from the geostationary lightning mapper, which in this case has tilted the issuance of a warning uh, earlier than would have done if only using radar data. So the lightning imager allows for additional lead time in certain situations for forecasting and warnings of severe events. And that is very useful information. Also for Africa, imagine this imagery over a tropical area in Africa, Lake Victoria region, for example, for things like the highway project, this is and could be very important information if this is displayed in a, an attractive form for operational forecasters. Next slide. So to conclude this talk by Bartolomeo and myself, the LI accumulated flash area product that will be disseminated to Africa is providing very important and promising information for operational weather forecasting and severe warnings. It will enable the monitoring of the flash rate down to the uh, accumulation interval of 30 seconds and the flash spatial extension, which are both important proxies for the development of severe storms or the intensification of a convective system. Such products can be easily combined over longer periods of time and integrated, for example, to be aligned with a 10 minute FCI repeat cycle. So to conclude, in general, we believe these data are, and that has been stressed also by speakers in the morning, by the Radek chair, Leanne Simpson, for example, very important use cases can be severe weather and lightning warnings. For example, also in an aerodrome or airport setting where you get a warning for a lightning that can extend way beyond a convective line, for example, even if you think the storm is over. You can better track the, uh, the intensity and movement of active convective areas, the life cycle of storms, the climatology of lightning for risk assessment. There was a graph on this in the presentation by the UMATSAT Director General this morning. And also on the atmospheric chemistry, uh, lightnings are a cause for the production of uh, NOx and, and nitrous oxides, nitric oxide and NO2, which are important components for ozone formation in the troposphere and air pollution. In short, not all and everything can be detected by the lightning imager. There can be storms which are low level and relatively warm, where there's very little lightning, but still heavy impact. 
So it is not a panacea for everything, but it is going to be an exciting and useful addition. And a lot of research needs to go into examining this data. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation. Now the floor is open for the Q&A. And first, we've got a question from Madagascar. And it is, how, how was or will be the LI product validated based on which data and which information? And this question is posed to Bartolomeo. Thank you for the question. So um, <clears throat> I'm actually uh, in charge of developing the strategy for validating the LI products and also implementing, implementing the tools needed for these. Uh, we are paying a lot of attention to comparison against uh, ground networks. And uh, uh, we will employ different ground networks. Uh, actually, many of them were listed in the table I've presented earlier. And to that, we are gonna add very soon the South African Lightning Detection System. Uh, we had actually a meeting yesterday to kick off these activities. So validation will be done against ground networks and in those areas where the LI and GLM field of view uh, are overlapping, we would do also validation against GLM. Here, I would like to use the chance to uh, uh, communicate that uh, on top of these, uh, we are actually exploring the possibility of performing uh, dedicated campaigns using a lightning mapping array, these VHF detectors with uh, great detection capabilities over Africa. Of course, uh, I mean, Africa is a very important uh, part of the LI field of view. That's where actually most of the lighting activity will take place. And that's why we want to use the chance to have a dedicated campaign over African territories uh, to validate our instrument. Thanks a lot for that answer. So the next question comes from Mohan Wali Ait Meziane. And he asks, hello, can you tell me about the usage of these MTG products on data assimilation, numerical weather regional models? And this goes to Stefan Boyinski. Yes, there is exploratory work on using LI as a proxy for the presence of ice particles in clouds in updraft situations. Graupel is a, a, a type of ice particle that is typically uh, present when there is uh, the formation of strong charges in, a, in an updraft and there are groups in Meteo France for example who are looking at using uh, the data from the lightning imager for assimilation into their uh, numerical weather prediction model and there are also other groups who are attempting to do so. Very important question and very important developments. Okay, thank you for your answer. So the next question is in French, so I'm going to give it over to Vincent. Oui, merci Mimi. Uh, donc la question est de Monsieur Laminba de la Guinée, uh, qui demande uh, ce qui est prévu pour améliorer l'assistance au secteur maritime uh, pour la sécurité en mer des, pêche des pêcheurs et des usagers de la mer. Et uh, s'il n'y a rien de prévu, il conseille de s'approcher, d'impliquer les organisations s'occupant de ce secteur océanique et mer. Donc, euh, avec MTG, quelles seraient les améliorations pour les prévisions en mer Est-ce que Denis pourrait répondre à cette question ou, ou Stéphane bon, C'est une question très euh, générale. Par rapport aux nouveaux missions, il y a une, 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 disons une capacité secondaire du, du majeur FCI, FCI de détecter les propriétés de, des zones littorales et de l'océan. Ce n'est pas un instrument qui a été construit pour ça, mais euh, avec la, la résolution plus fine, on va pouvoir voir les variations de la couleur de l'océan, par exemple, euh, mieux que maintenant. Mais je pense que la question est beaucoup plus générale au niveau de, de mécanismes d'assistance pour euh, soutenir des applications, des institutions euh, dans le domaine de l'océanographie. Donc, je pense que c'est à toi, Vincent, de, de connaître un peu mieux le, la situation. Merci, oui. Je, je pourrais juste, hein, effectivement, euh, comme la session est sur MTG, c'est vrai que les... Bon, 
MTG permettra aussi d'améliorer les prévisions marines, mais euh, EMETSAT euh, a d'autres satellites, euh, notamment les satellites Jason, METOP, ou également les satellites Sentinel-3 et Sentinel-6 du programme Copernicus, qui sont spécifiquement dédiés à l'observation euh, du milieu euh, marin, que ce soit océanographique ou euh, au bio, biophysique euh, de la mer. Et on est déjà pour la région de, de, de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, par exemple, où M. Ba euh, est, est localisé. Nous travaillons être, en étroite coopération avec l'Université du Ghana, le centre de la CDAO pour la maritime, qui euh, travaille euh, à la fabrication de produits à valeur ajoutée pour les, la région de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Euh, D'ailleurs, on aura un troisième webinaire cette année, probablement à, 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 en, en octobre, qui sera dédié euh, aux aspects euh, marins et au soutien des satellites pour l'économie bleue. Thank you, Mimi Flor. It's back to you. Thank you very much, François. So we're going to move on to question number four, and this is from Boyan, and he asks: There is no need to include all meteorological radar data online. Rain. Rainage network to MSG for verification of rain forecasting algorithms. The amount of rain in tropical storms is to be estimated. So this can be answered by Vincent. Uh, okay, I will try and maybe my colleague can jump in. So uh, satellites are, are not measuring directly the rain, uh, but they can give a good estimate of uh, rain density. It is already the case with MSG, but also in combining geostationary with um, polar orbiting satellite, uh, we, there is some uh, rain estimate products that are uh, delivered. The, uh, UMETSAT also, uh, the, notably the hydrology staff of uh, UMETSAT is providing such data. So there is some improvement that will be possibly done with MTG. I'm not a specialist on that, maybe. But um, for sure, uh, the satellite data are not sufficient to estimate properly the, the rain gauge. So it's, it's very important, as, as uh, underlined by Mr. Uh, uh, Boyan, to combine that with all possible ground network radar data or rain gauges in order to have a, um, a solid and consolidated uh, estimate of the of the rain uh, as, as input to, to hydrological forecast uh, model. So I don't know if someone could uh, say something about MTG for rain uh, estimate. Maybe Stefan. There are plans in the hydrology staff to exploit FCI and also LI with regard to estimates of rain rate and quantitative rainfall using the higher resolution and uh, the higher sensitivity of the channels. And they are also partnering with uh, institutions in Africa to have better validation sites for this. I can look up for the details if necessary. Thank you very much for this answer. So I think we still have some time. Yeah, we can yes. still get one more question. So let's take this one. Good. So, somebody is asking concerning the detection efficiency: Is there a percentage value for each region or FOV? And I think Bartolomeo could answer this question. Yes. So um, I have presented a map uh, for flash detection efficiency. Efficiency, excuse me, uh, during night conditions. Um, I would like to uh, invite uh, not just the person that raised the question, but also the other attendees to go to the UMASAT webpage. There is a technical note in which uh, we have published our complete uh, analysis on the pre-flight performance assessment for a lie. And that's where you will understand also how the detection efficiency will vary within the field of view. What I can say is that in terms of flash detection efficiency, <clears throat> uh, the performances are expected to be uh, quite uniform through the field of view. Huh? Uh, only at the very edges uh, of the life of the view, we are expecting to get a degradation in the detection uh, efficiency. But please refer to this technical note. Maybe uh, I can provide you with the link to the document so that then you can publish it uh, and provide the, the attendees with this. 
Maybe Bartolome, you can copy paste the link in the in the chat box to yes, all, sir. all attendees and panelists. Yeah. Definitely, I will do it immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your answers. So, in order to keep up with the time, I would say we'll move on to the next presentation. And for everybody whose question wasn't answered right now, there's no problem. They're going to be answered in written form on the Slido page. So, next on the agenda is Sally Warnup, and she's going to hold a presentation about MTG Africa data access mechanisms and training. Sally Warnup, you have the floor. Thank you and good afternoon everybody and um, thank you for sticking with us in the afternoon session. Okay, I've got a very short presentation just about data access mechanisms and their evolutions as we enter the MTG era and then a single slide just to remind you all of the training opportunities that we make available to you. Okay, um, next slide please. I hope you're all familiar with this slide. So of course, this is UMECCAST Africa. It's our kind of workhorse um, data delivery mechanism for NRT data. It provides you with a guaranteed service and it's what you're used to for receiving um, the current MSG satellite service. Now, we're not envisaging any significant changes in this service uh, as we move into MTG. The current actual satellite uh, contractor that we're using um, is in place until at least the end of 2024, and we have options to extend that existing contract until 2027, so well into the start of MTG operations. Okay, you're familiar with the setup, the antenna, typical antenna size, around about 2.4 meters for good reception within the African footprint. And already today, we're delivering over 226 data collections through this service. Yes, it will be the service that delivers the new MTG Africa um, product service that you've heard and, and has been described to you today by Denny and also the follow-on presentation on the LI. So these are the data that you will receive through, through the satellite service. And as always, our group uh, RADEG are the group that are meeting regularly to discuss the content and the evolution of the content of the baseline of this service. So nothing changes there, apart from we have to increase the bandwidth a little bit. Next slide, please. Yeah, so to anticipate the data flows coming in around about mid-2023, um, we are ramping up the 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 um, capacity of the Africa service to accommodate the first MTGI imager data. And we see a pretty much a plateau effect until we maybe lose the MSG satellite services when they begin to uh, become end of life. And so the typical service that you would continue to receive via the MSG satellite would be the Indian Ocean data coverage. And we do not anticipate that we will have available satellites to do that beyond maybe into the early 20, 2030 timeframe. Okay, next slide, please. But now for something completely different or now for something new. So you might cast that light is your baseline, but we are now diversifying in our data access mechanisms, not just for our European user audience, but also for our African user community. So in future, you could additionally be receiving data through other delivery mechanisms. For example, viewing data on our new view service, downloading data on our new data store service, using our data tailor software to customize those data before you download them, or using that software in conjunction with the feed that you receive on your UMECAS satellite to actually um, take away only the data you want and store locally only the data you want. Or you may be one of the users who wants to take advantage of a UMECAS terrestrial service as well. And we're also introducing some uh, a weather cloud, a cloud uh, processing environment for our member state MET services. And obviously this is also something that maybe in future you as a community want to think about the use of and value of hosted processing in future. Next slide, please. Okay, I don't have time to go into much detail of all of these new services, so I've just got one simple slide on each of them with lots of detail. I, I won't read it all out, but what's important here is our new UMAP view service. It, it, will, it will take over the existing view service. What's nice about this service is we can also include licensed data. So if you've already got a data license with us, you can already access visualizations of Metasat data which are um, less than three hours old. So the 50-minute data as we're generating the, the imagery. It contains a whole load of RGBs and some level two products as well. So we have visualizations from Copernicus Sentinel-3, from METOP and from our Metasat suite of satellites. 
The new service offers um, what we call web coverage and web uh, feature um, capabilities. That means you can click on a point and you can get a value for that pixel or for that vector. So there's a nice way of looking at the ASCAT Wind um, products using, using the new view service. That's the URL, view.umetsat.in, and you can access it already today. Next slide, please. The data store. The data store. Um, the data store will replace our current data archive, so our historical archive of data. We will still maintain a deep archive at UMETSAT for data preservation purposes, but users in future will interface with the new data store in order to access the archive of data. And the data store will not only hold the archive of our satellite data, it also allows users access to near real-time data as well. So without the need for a UMATCAS reception station or any other reception equipment, you could come to this service and you can download the data from the service. It's possible to use the web UI, but if you're going to be downloading a lot of data, our recommendation would then be to, to utilize the RESTful APIs uh, that we have in place. So this is really kind of going to be quite a game changer if you maybe want to access data which typically you do not receive through a UMATCAS station. So it would be one opportunity for you to, to take advantage of data that you may not get through your UMATCAS satellite service. Next slide, please. The data store is also complemented by a piece of software called the Data Tailor. So the Data Tailor web service works in conjunction with the data store and allows users to customize um, the data before they download it. So reducing the volume of data that you need to download potentially. So with the Data Tailor, you can actually change the format. So if we are providing a format in native and you would prefer NetCDF, the Data Tailor can convert that to NetCDF and you download the NetCDF files. If you would like to have a cutout, a region of interest, if you're only interested in um, data on the east coast of Africa, then you could potentially cut out data that is only relevant for your area of interest. And again, only take away the data that you need. You can also look at, um, use the, an RGB service to have a kind of quick look at the data and many more features of this software. The software itself is also available as a standalone locally downloaded software. So you could potentially use this software on data that you have received through your UMECAS reception station. If you say wanted to build an archive of data and you only wanted to um, store a subset of the new MTG data, for example, you could use the data tailor software to customize what you retain locally as well from the data that you have received through your UMECAS reception station or any other means. So there's a lot of potential for the data tailor software. The data tailor software does not replace visualization software. So this is not a replacement for your current Synergy software, for example. It's very much a, a processing software and could be used in conjunction with other software that you have available. Next slide, please. Okay, as I said, I can't give you too much of an introduction to these new data services. They're currently in pilot mode. They're currently all available. I recommend you do take a little look at them, but we do have a few how-to videos, so they're not too long if you want to get a brief introduction to what you can do with these new services. So I've got here the URLs. They're embedded into this PowerPoint, so hopefully you can get them. If you can't get them from this PowerPoint, they're available on our YouTube site. So one for UMAT View, one for the Data Store, and one for the Data Tailor. And Hopefully next week we'll be releasing a new video for the data store, which will update the current one that you see in front of you. So keep an eye out for that. And we do make announcements when we have new videos too. So yeah, next slide, please. Okay, then the final new one on the block, of course, is UMECAS Terrestrial. The UMECAS Terrestrial service works in the same way as the UMECAS Satellite Service. It uses the whole multicast technology to deliver data from one source to many users. Instead of having the antenna, the, L, the LMB, the, all the front end that you typically have with your UMECAS satellite station, here you're having the data through your terrestrial, if you like, internet or network um, access. And um, what is important here is that we intend in future to put the full set of our UMECAS satellite data onto the terrestrial service. This would also include the, the MPG for Africa 
um, product that we produce as well, in addition to having some data in near real time, which do not exist on the satellite service, even for our European users. So we see this as a good mechanism to deliver a lot of high volume data to a lot of users, including maybe some, use, some data which are only required for specialist users. So it is an opportunity for those of you who would need access to the full um, FCI product in NRT. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you're looking at um, access to the terrestrial service in Africa, then your local NREN connection is being set up by something called Africa Connect3. I'm not an expert here. I only take some information from their, from their website. They are now starting their third phase. They already have connections in several countries. I don't know how up to date this information is on this slide, but it looks like they have covered several of them across the continent with more planned um, in this next phase. So we appreciate not all of you yet can connect to this, but this hopefully is evolving in the coming years and would be an opportunity for you to access the full satellite data via terrestrial if this is what you need and your, your, your service requires this. For example, if you would like to run the now casting SAF software, it's quite likely you will need the full FCI product. And if you're a, a service that requires this, then terrestrial may be the way forward for you. Next slide, please. So just to put that all into a bit of a context and all of our diversity that comes. Um, so you have your UMECcast Africa service, the stalwart, the one that will deliver the special MTG Africa service to you. On top of that, and of course, sorry, I should add, if for those of you in the North African countries, you also have, of course, ac access to the UMECcast Europe service. And here we have a few changes coming in that we will operate a prime and a backup, a restorable and a non-restorable. I won't go into any more details here, but there's a new change that's coming with the UMECcast Europe service in 2023. But for our African, uh, core African users, you will be accessing UMECcast Africa. You then, if you have access to the terrestrial service, would be able to access a additional satellite data not included on the Africa stream. And in addition, you could use the terrestrial as a backup if you have any local problems with your, with your satellite reception. And everyone should note that the data store is available, which has the complete archive of our data, but also near real time access if you require access. If you were developing, I don't know, um, a case study and you just needed the last three days worth of data, you could potentially use the data store to access um, the data that you need, take away and create your, your case study around that, for example. So there are lots of opportunities. And don't forget, we have our view service. So if you don't want to look at the data themselves and you're happy to look at some of the visualization, then the view service is also available for you with ready to use visualizations. And it is a hope that we will have the first FCI visualizations available towards the end of the commissioning period um, of MTG so that we can offer you the opportunity, a first glimpse of, uh, of MTG data as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to give a little bit of a recap, there is a changing data landscape coming and it's also affecting Africa too. So yes, the UMECS Africa service will deliver the new MTG Africa, Africa product. The full MTG FCI service will be available on the UMECCAS terrestrial and our data store service, so our download service and our alternative um, push service. In future, your NMHS could receive data and use data from a range of data access mechanisms. So there's lots of opportunity. If you'd like to learn more about our new data services, we're having regular open webinars. They're advertised through our website and the training calendar. And if you want to know more, visit the knowledge base where we've got a lot of detailed information on how to access these new services, including information about the UMECCAS terrestrial service as well. We'd like to hear from you if you're thinking about setting up a UMECCAS terrestrial service. It's already available. You could already begin to do this if this is important for your weather service. And these new data services are available. They're in pilot mode now. They should be coming operational towards the end of Q2, but do try them out. Next slide, please. Okay, maybe just another consideration. I think there was a question earlier this morning about hardware and software uh, and what updates will come. 
yes, we'll talk. And in the next presentation, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about the, the new Puma replacement station. And there will be some special software available to visualize and process the new MTG FCI service that Africa, that you will receive by, via your UMEC Cast Africa service. But if you're planning to access the full MTG FCI service, you may need to procure and or develop your own processing software to accommodate this. So it might be something that you need to think about. As part of our general preparation of our users for MTG, we are engaging with our known user community of manufacturers. We had actually a special MTG for Africa manufacturer session a couple of weeks ago. So we're already working to build up some interest in manufacturers supporting the new Puma replacement station. We also have dedicated web webinars from time to time with application software providers to ensure that they understand the new features of the, of the MTG service. And we're planning an exhibition space at the next UMETSAC conference, which takes place in September. It will be an online event now, and perhaps as an opportunity for something similar at a future African user forum. Let's see. Anyway, such events do provide opportunities for you to engage with these manufacturers to discuss potential software and hardware solutions if you wish to procure something in addition to whatever you receive through um, the new um, beneficiary service that comes as a follow on from, from Puma. Um, so do think about that. So do take advantage of any opportunities to engage with manufacturers as you need. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so finally, just a couple of comments on, on training. Um, before I mentioned on this slide, there was a couple of comments, I think, in the, in the feedback earlier on about will our administrators be trained in the new um, MTG um, hardware and software that will come in the Puma replacement? I think Vincent will say a few more words after this presentation. Yes, that sort of training should and hopefully will be foreseen in the contract that will take place. Um, but this is also outside of the... Uh, remit of where UMETSAT sits, but this is certainly something that we would recommend. And we know from the experience that you, you and the feedback you gave from the first uh, Puma stations, it's really important that you have this training and that your operators are able to use and utilize the software accordingly. Okay, but turning a little bit now to training in the actual satellite, use of the satellite data um, ourselves, we've got an expert online in, 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 uh, in the shape of Leanne, so I'm sure she can answer any questions anybody has. But just to recap, of course, we have these four centers of excellence in, 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 Af in the African continent, Niamey, Casablanca, Nairobi, and Petro Pretoria. They're doing their regular training and they're already introducing um, new ideas about what, uh, what will come with MTG. So that's already an evolving thing Thing that's happening. There are annual application courses online and face-to-face. -face. You'll see that online is becoming much more the des res. It's the way that we're surviving today. And of course, the more online courses you have, the more people you can train. So it's also very positive. So there's lots of development there. And of course, there's a, a lot of self-help and self-pacing material. So if you can't attend an official course, there's opportunities for you to actually work offline and, and, and use the, the tools that are already available. And yeah, the regular weather briefings are taking place. Join in with those if you've not already done so. You can learn a little, a lot about what you can actually um, discover in the data. And hopefully there'll be more and more that might be introducing information about future things towards MTG. So yes, ASMET for Africa is, is the thing to follow. If you're not aware of their website, then here's the, the URL. And do take a look at the opportunities that are available for all of the training. And as always, we keep you informed. Don't forget, we've got a training calendar where we advertise all of our training events, including the training events of our partners. So, um, yeah, lots of information on training to come um, in future. And I think that is my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. So we've reached the last presentation of the day now, and this one will come from Vincent Gabalio. And he's going to hold a presentation about MTG Africa, Transition Roadmap for the User Community. At this point, I'd like to thank everybody who has been with us since morning, and I give the floor to Vansa. Thank you, Mimi. Good afternoon, everybody, again. So this will be the last presentation of the afternoon, and I will try to be as short as possible so that we have also sufficient time to uh, go through uh, several of the questions that you raised on Slido. 
I think that through Sally's presentation and mine, hopefully we will be answering to some of the questions that were related to the infrastructure, way to access training. There were quite a lot of, quite several questions related to, to these two uh, thema. So uh, I will start my presentation uh, that will be focused on the transition period uh, between the current uh, Metosat second generation and the new uh, Metosat third generation, focusing especially on the uh, in, um, MTGI, so the Imager uh, satellite, which is the, the one ensuring the, the continuity of, of uh, MSG. So, uh, regarding the zero degree satellite service, so the, the satellite which will be above the Guinea Gulf and offering the same coverage as what Metosat 9 and 10 are offering today. So, pending the successful launch of the satellite in the fourth quarter of 2022, we are planning to have one year of commissioning uh, of the new satellites with validation of the various instruments, which means that the data will start to be available on a test uh, mode in 2023, but most probably towards for Africa, it will be towards the end of 2023 that you will get start getting uh, what we will call um, operational uh, product uh, for Africa. This means also that in terms of your reception station, uh, we are also have some contact with industry to see how their development is going on. It's not yet fully clear, but we should be able to, uh, or you should be able to procure some MTG compatible station at during the year 2023, with maybe some procurement starting already in 2022 for a deployment in 23, 24. Um, this would also correspond to the start of some training activities for the use of these new MTG services based on real data. Uh, in the meantime, uh, there is some test or some simulated data which are made available, mainly for, for uh, software manufacturers and a few researchers to start preparing uh, for the new uh, software and for the uh, training. Next slide, please. So here you have the schedule. So we will have MSG ensuring the zero degree services uh, until the end of uh, 2024. But as of end of 23 and beginning of 24, we will start also disseminating MTG Africa product as a, if you want, as a backup or as a trial mode. And there will be a switch uh, towards the end of 2024 that will correspond also to, to the launch of the second MTG major uh, uh, that uh, we will start switching and the MTG will start providing the uh, zero degree service as of uh, beginning end of 24. So this is really the deadline if you want for Africa to be equipped with MTG reception station um, to get the data from MTG and to be able to ensure continuity of services without interruption between MSG and MTG. So this means that the time frame for the deployment of user reception station is obviously as soon as possible, but this means also as soon as such stations who are MTG compatible will be available either on the market or uh, uh, through um, freeware or things or this type of, of, um, of availability. Uh, so this uh, should happen in the year 23-24. Next slide. Here you see also in terms of Humedcast Africa, uh, what it means in terms of bandwidth usage. So you will have as when we will start uh, disseminating MTG uh, imagery data to Africa. So some FCI and, and lightning imager, there will be a jump in the quantity of that, that which is disseminated. And uh, after a certain time, but MSG will still be there for the IODC service. So when this will end, uh, there will be a, a low and we will have again only MTG data, which mean also that during a certain period of time, uh, your reception station will have to be able to read, process and display both MSG and MTG data and if needed, switching from one to the other. Next slide. 
So regarding the upgrade of the Puma station, and here I will focus on the Puma station, which are the stage, the UMED CAS reception station that have been installed in all uh, uh, national meteorological services in Africa. However, what is uh, this reflection and what, what, what is presented here is also valid for other UMED CAS reception stations that allow some MSG visualization. But obviously, and what, as Marianne said this morning, or the, the presenter, we are still hoping to have a good cooperation with the European Union, African Union, and AMCOMET in order to be able to provide an upgrade of the Puma station uh, in time so that uh, the station, the primary station at the MET services in the uh, whole of uh, Africa uh, will be uh, ready for MTG on time. Uh, so based on the timeline that I presented, uh, as I, and I repeat the same message actually, but it's an important one, I think, is that the African users need to have a new MTG compatible stations by end of 2024 in order to ensure continuity of services with the MSG data. So we have not, uh, in order to match this deadline, next slide, we have uh, been working already closely with the African Union Commission actually through various programs, the MESA one and then the GMS in Africa and the CLIMSA program which will be launched. So as you know, there have been already a deployment of the Puma 2015 station in 2016-2017. Uh, as we did a survey recently at the end of uh, last year, which shows that about 75% of those Puma 2015 stations are still operational and in, in, uh, are used daily. There are some stations where there is some issues and uh, our help desk is working also to try to solve that uh, whenever possible. And, um, but there is in order to keep those Puma 2015 station up to date, at least until 2022-23, uh, we are working closely with the GMS and Africa program, which has uh, issued a tender uh, recently, actually, uh, a call for, uh, for um, industry to uh, ensure the maintenance of some Puma and MESA station hardware. Uh, the result of this tender is not yet known, but um, we will uh, ensure that, uh, I mean, you will be contacted probably by the African Union Commission or by us in order to inform you uh, of, of when this, this um, facility to, to support the maintenance of the station will be available. In terms of software of updates, so in the current Puma 2015, you have the, the Synergy software. There is already a software update that has been commissioned, that's been requested. Uh, last year, we have been working closely with Telespatio M M MFI in order to upgrade the software, which is currently in your Puma 2015 station, to allow you to visualize some additional products, notably the rapidly developing Thunderstone or some four kilometers model uh, that are provided by the UK met service especially over the central africa region um, i was speaking about the climsa program which is a program about climate services in africa caribbean and pacific but with a strong component on africa led by the african union but also with the involvement of the regional climate centers so as part of this program there is some funding to have an update of the puma station uh, with a procurement that will be launched in 2022 and which would include already a specification for a compatibility with MTG. So if everything goes well, uh, we should be uh, through CLIMSA in position, the African Union should be in position to uh, provide an upgrade of the Puma stations to make them MTG compatible. This will be a first step because in 2022, we are, we are not yet completely sure that what will be deployed will be fully compatible. So there will need to be some adjustment probably in 23, 24, when the real data will start to be available in order to ensure a full exploitation of the MTG data by the MET services in Africa, and then also by other uh, users. So, so there is a willingness from the EU and African Union Commission to continue the effort that has been done through the Puma, AMEST, MESA uh, program to uh, provide uh, further upgrade to the Puma station 
uh, in order to ensure more than 20 years of continuity of operational receptions of Metosat uh, data in Africa, uh, including uh, for this transition uh, to Metosat third generation. So we are currently working on, on, on this file uh, together with the RIDEG and the African Union Commission. Uh, we hope uh, to be able to present you something more concrete uh, in the UMETSAT user forum uh, that is planned in September this year, which might um, most probably will be also a virtual forum uh, due to the current pandemic, but uh, uh, you will receive from some more information. But really, we would like this autumn to give you more information about the, the exact content of this transition and what will be the exact specification that will be brought forward for this upgrade. Next slide. So the time frame uh, for the transition towards MTG, as I repeat, 2022-24 is the refurbishment of the Puma 2015 station uh, it will be an open tender, so we might have a new software because also the current synergy is not yet uh, not fully maintained by by uh, is, uh, you know that Metro France International has, has switched to a web-based synergy. Uh, so we will need anyway to to uh, to launch a new tender uh, uh, with the African Union. Actually, we launch which will be open to competition. So we might have some newcomers here. Uh, and the objective is to have a new software which can do both MSG and MTG with an upgrade of your uh, hardware, mainly the PC. Normally, as Sally said, we will continue to rely on new Metcast Africa. So your antenna on LNB should still be valid and will be still compatible with MTG. It's only the PC the, the, the three uh, uh, computers uh, which will need to be upgraded. So we are currently discussing the specification and requirements. Uh, we will have to discuss that actually uh, with the RIDEG. We already collected through the survey some feedback from all the MET services on the current Puma station and try to integrate that uh, to the new stations. So the absolute deadline is indeed 2024. Uh, with a validation of the full MTG compatible station when the real MTG data will be available operationally. Uh, and this, as I said pre previously, might request some possible upgrade or update of the soft software in order to ensure that as of end of 2024, in all MET services, you have a station which allows you to continue the services that you are currently providing with MSG but not only a continuity, also uh, taking benefit of some new data, notably from the FCI instruments and the lightning imager, uh, which uh, will be uh, two important uh, new assets for many your no casting um, uh, capabilities. But as we've seen this morning, it's not only for aviation, and no casting severe weather, uh, it will bring also a lot of added value for uh, other sectors like the agriculture, uh, water management, um, and health uh, sector also. Uh, beyond uh, the, the, I would say, the traditional one. Next slide. So the key message, uh, MTG data will start to be available over Africa in 2023. Uh, there will be a parallel operation of MTG and MSG until end of 24. With here, uh, maybe I need also to, uh, uh, to uh, highlight that MSG will continue to be operational also over the Indian Oceans beyond 2024. So the MTG compatible stations need to be ready by the end of 24 to ensure continuity of service. And the MSG will still operate, as I said before, over the Indian Oceans. Uh, and this will cover also a large part of Africa. If you look at what the, the Metosat 8 is currently uh, providing, you can see that Metosat 8, who is located over the Indian Oceans, uh, the, the disk is also covering a big part of Africa. Okay, next slide. And this uh, concludes my presentation, and I would like to thank you uh, all for uh, listening to it. And I give back the floor to Mimi for the next uh, question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this concludes the presentation part of today. So we're going to start with our first question from the session. And this question comes from Katielu. 
and he asks, what will the a station of Mesa be carried along for improvement and upgrade with this MTG transition? If yes, how? Is it possible to integrate the station technology with the new MTG station as the station is not as strong as the Puma station? And this question, yeah, is asked uh, for, to Vincent. So Vincent, you can answer the question. Merci Mimi et merci aux collègues du, du Niger qui ont été très actifs euh, durant ce webinaire, notamment dans le slide où, euh, avec plusieurs euh, que questions liées effectivement à la mise à jour des stations euh, Puma et Mesa. Alors, la station Mesa e-Station, effectivement, euh, nous travaillons avec les collègues du JRC, mais nous n'avons pas encore une information très précise de savoir ce qu'ils prévoient de faire avec le MTG. Euh, par rapport à un update de leur e-station. Mais ce qui est sûr, c'est que pour les services météo, il y a une volonté de continuer la ligne des stations Puma, peut-être avec des softwares différents, mais en tout cas avec les mêmes fonctionnalités, c'est d'avoir dans les services météo une suite de Puma compatible avec MTG qui puisse principalement vous servir pour tout ce qui est euh, prévision instantanée, le no-casting, qui, qui est la fonction première, je dirais, des satellites météosat. Ensuite, euh, il y aura effectivement, si les stations Puma peuvent aussi faire un support à l'agrométrologie ou des aspects comme ça, euh, ce serait bien. Mais nous, nous discutons avec notre partenaire du JRC aussi pour voir comment euh, la e-station, qui est principalement utilisée pour euh, le, le, la surveillance de l'environnement, euh, de l'agriculture, de la gestion en eau, euh, puissent aussi intégrer euh, le plus rapidement possible les nouvelles stations, les nouvelles données de MTG pour que euh, les, les bénéfices de MTG ne soient pas seulement pour la prévision euh, euh, instantanée, le no-casting pour l'aviation, pour les, les severe weather, les, les événements euh, extrêmes, mais puissent aussi euh, que vous puissiez effectivement aussi de bénéficier des, de nouveaux outils pour, pour euh, permettre d'avoir des, des, de transformer les, les, les données MTG en bénéfices euh, pour euh, tout ce qui est secteur agro euh, météorologique, gestion de l'eau, etc. Mais là, les, nous avons encore, pour l'instant, les décisions, les, les discussions ont, ont, ont débuté. Euh, nous n'avons pas encore de, de, de roadmap, de, de feuille de route très concrète euh, pour la, la mise à jour de la e-station par rapport à, à, à MTG. Merci. Thank you very much for your answer. The next question goes to Sally and is asked from Tarek and he asks, can the current solution used for MSG be used again and still applicable for the MTG reception or do we need to upgrade it? Otherwise, is there a technical document produced by UMITSA team in which they describe the equipment or infrastructure? Do we need to receive MTG data by UMIT cast mechanism? Yeah, okay, I actually answered this one um, directly in, 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 the, in the Slido. But yes, th so for UMECast Africa, there aren't any changes for the, the front end, so the, the antenna and the LMB. Um, what, of course, will be changed, and that's what Vincent has just been describing, is the hardware and software that the users will use because all of the data rates and the data themselves are changing. For UMECCAST Europe, and I guess you will be a UMECCAST Europe user, there will be a change because we will introduce from 2023 onwards um, a restorable and a non-restorable service. So in order to take advantage of data from both satellites, the backup satellite and the prime satellite, um, you would need to have either a dual feed or a second antenna. So there will be a bit of a change coming for that. All of the uh, information is going to be in our TD15, and it's also included in our knowledge base. And that was the knowledge base link was given in my presentation. So yes, the technical information is available or will be coming available very shortly because we already know some of the details. Of course, always bear in mind that the data rates are going to change. So your downstream processing will obviously always have to be updated as well as your front end in the case of, of the UMECCAST um, Europe service. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. So the next question is from Steve and he asks, for AMSAF and research collaboration, will MTG FCI consider special rapid scan uh, service collections in Africa or a non-interface basis? 
goes policy allows and encourages such requests from NMHS and researchers throughout the Americas that help understanding and making these products. So this one goes towards a Duny or maybe also Vincent could answer it. Yes, I think Denis had uh, an urgent call, so I will take uh, this question. So basically, uh, the, the, um, uh, we are not planning to uh, do any rapid scan over uh, Africa. So the rapid scan, uh, the, the, the MTG uh, instruments is different than the one from, from GOES, and in a way does not offer these uh, uh, functionalities or this flexibility and uh, we will keep, uh, we are not planning to do any rapid scan, even at research level uh, over uh, Africa. But maybe uh, Stefan or Sally, you would like to complement uh, on this? I, I, I could only add, Vincent, yes, I mean, in the future for our imaging service, so that's the FCI and the LI service, we will operate with two satellites. So we'll have one satellite providing the what we call the full disk, service. So that's the typical view that you see now from MSG. Um, the data that will be available um, to Africa is derived from this service. And then the second imaging satellite will be providing the rapid scan service over Europe. And we have a commitment to our member state met service to provide a permanent, if you like, rapid scanning service. So the second imaging satellite will be doing rapid scan. When it's not doing rapid scan, it will be acting as backup to the zero degree or the full disk um, satellite service. So it is unlikely that we can foresee within this configuration that we can offer a rapid scanning service to Africa. This does not mean to say that the FCI instrument cannot scan that region. It can, it's capable of scanning anywhere within, within the disk, um, but it is just the commitment that we've made towards our member states with respect to the rapid scanning service for Europe that doesn't actually allow us any available um, satellites to offer an equivalent service uh, to Africa. But of course, as, as you know, with the MTG service, you'll have um, satellite data at 10 minute intervals. I hope that helps to complement the answer. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to our next question, which comes from Egypt and is also asking Sally, is HumidCast terrestrial only backup for HumidCast satellite or can it receive complementary data? Um, yeah, no, you should um, you should consider it as just a backup. Yes, it is a backup. So it can be work as a backup for the satellite service, but it's actually providing access to users who maybe are not within the footprint of the of the, the UMECAS Africa or the UMECAS Europe service. So we actually already use the terrestrial service to provide data to our partners in China, in Japan, in the US. Um, so it actually has a, a global um, access potential. So using the different uh, academic networks works. So it's not really, it's not solely for backup, but in the context of Africa, it could be used as a backup service. But it's also worth noting that we will deliver some data in near real time only through the, the terrestrial service. So it would be the only way to get the data in future. For example, if you're thinking of um, the full spectral of Yazi, for example, this is probably only delivered in near real time through our terrestrial service, and it wouldn't be available through our UMECCAST Europe satellite service. So it's much more than a backup. It's sometimes the only way for users to get data in near real time through a dedicated and guaranteed uh, network. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you very much. So the next question comes from Mike Higgins and it's a short question he's just asking. I'd like to know if the training at the WMO training center will be free of charge. So, Hi, so the short answer is uh, yes. Um, so the invitations go out, we expect uh, nom nominations to um, be supported by your PRs. Um, but the training isn't all face-to-face, -face. a lot of it is online, which helps to make it more accessible to a lot of people. But at the point of use, yes, it is free of charge. Thank you very much. So we can move on to the next question. And it asks, what is the difference between the LI product for Africa and for Europe? And is it possible? Ah, and it continues in French, as I see. So I think I'd refer again to Vincent because my French isn't that good. Vincent? 
Yes, thank you, uh, Mimi. So it's two questions in one. Actually, the first is about the difference, if there is any difference between LI products for Africa and for Europe. And the second one in English is, will it be possible to do um, a projection, so a forecast of the uh, lightning uh, when we observe the evolution of thunderstorm? I don't know if Stefan of, or Bartolomeo could uh, provide an answer to that. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Bartolomeo is, isn't here anymore. On the first question, whether there is a difference? No, there is no difference. It's uh, true that on the UMEDCAS Africa satellite service, only the accumulated flash uh, area product is going to be disseminated in the real time. There are more products which are produced, but they're not available in the real time currently in the MTG Africa baseline. From the product properties, there's no difference. On the second question, that's a really difficult question. And it's a question raised by a number of operation forecasters. They are not only interested in what's happening now, but of course they want to forecast. And uh, forecasting the <clears throat> presence of lightning is is being done using, um, you could call it machine learning, you could call it uh, regression or extrapolation methods. And there are tools, now casting tools that are doing this to give you a probabilistic forecast for uh, the presence of lightning uh, over the next 30 minutes to an hour. These are operationally used in, for example, the United States, and there is uh, ambition to develop such tools also in Europe. And uh, it would be very interesting to, to do this also over Africa. Thank you very much for your answer, Stefan. So the next question is going to be in French, so I'm going to refer again to Vincent. Thank you, Mimi. Yes, the next question is about uh, uh, est en français, donc uh, on a les interprètes. Donc la question est où et comment peut-on avoir les mises à jour de Puma et Mesa 2015? Uh, alors, uh, pour répondre à cette question, uh, deux, deux choses. La mise à jour logicielle du, du, du Puma et, et du Mesa est en général uh, distribuée directement par Emetcast. Donc, une fois que le patch ou la, la mise à jour est prête, on la distribue via Umedcast, elle arrive automatiquement dans votre station et vous avez une petite fenêtre qui s'ouvre et qui vous demande d'accepter euh, la mise à jour de la, de, 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 la, de la Puma ou de la Mesa. Un autre moyen est de vous faire parvenir des, sous forme de clé USB euh, une, euh, une image de la station qui vous permet de, de ré, réinstaller complètement euh, la machine euh, avec la nouvelle version euh, mise à jour et de redémarrer votre système avec une version euh, mise à jour. Pour, en ce qui concerne la mise à jour de Puma pour MTG, euh, vu l'obsolescence aussi des, 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 des ordinateurs qui ont été euh, achetés en 2015, 2016 et déployés en 2016, 2017, euh, nous pensons qu'il serait nécessaire d'avoir des, des nouveaux PC. Euh, au lieu de faire une mise à jour euh, sur les PC existants, euh, ça sera plus simple et plus économique aussi euh, de euh, co complètement changer euh, les PC, de fournir des PC de nouvelle génération avec des, des capacités de calcul aussi augmentées qui vous permettront de visualiser euh, un plus grand nombre de données euh, qui sont distribuées par MTG, même si le canal d'accès à ces données, qui est Emetcast principalement, ou Metcast terrestrial, par exemple, si vous avez accès au Metcast terrestrial, euh, sera euh, plus facile avec des, des, des ordinateurs d'une nouvelle génération. Avant de repasser la parole à euh, Mimi, j'aimerais aujourd'hui, c'est une journée un peu spéciale, parce qu'on a une personne euh, qui a accompagné euh, le déploiement de toutes ces stations en Afrique depuis un peu plus de 20 ans, euh, et aujourd'hui, c'est son dernier jour de travail. Donc, je voudrais avoir son avis sur ce webinaire et sur les évolutions qui ont pu être faites. Je ne sais pas, c'est M. Emilio Barizano qui devrait être en ligne, je l'espère. Et si je peux lui laisser prendre la parole <rire> avec sa caméra. 
et nous donner un petit commentaire sur, euh, <rire> de manière générale sur le <rire> webinaire, mais sur les évolutions des 20 dernières années. À chaud <rire> euh, Bonjour tout le monde, bonjour Vincent. Ah ben, C'est une surprise parce que tu ne m'as vraiment pas du tout euh, prévenu. Euh, effectivement, euh, c'est mon dernier jour de travail, euh, euh, mon dernier jour de travail pour Remetsat et pour qui d'autre. Euh, c'est vraiment mon dernier jour de travail, donc je prends ma retraite. Et avant de donner mon avis sur le webinaire, je voudrais remercier vraiment euh, Remetsat euh, d'avoir permis pendant 22 ans de, de collaborer avec eux. Et effectivement, euh, on a de très, très beaux souvenirs. Euh, puisqu'on a commencé ensemble justement à l'arrivée de, de, de MS. On peut dire que c'est une génération, donc c'était vraiment très bien. Je veux remercier tous mes collègues africains avec qui j'ai passé de très, très bons moments, où on a, je pense, fait progresser la capacité de l'Afrique à, à absorber et à exploiter pour leur développement les données satellitaires de MEDSAT. Et vraiment, je, 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 suis, je suis assez heureux d'avoir participé à cette dernière réunion, même si elle est électronique. C'est qu'effectivement, tout ce que j'ai entendu sur, sur MTG, pour moi, c'est absolument fantastique. C'est presque un rêve. Et je crois que maintenant… La responsabilité est entre vos mains. Bien sûr, Metsat a fait son travail. Hein. J'espère qu'il va pouvoir lancer le satellite, mais maintenant, c'est un peu le travail de, de, tous, de, de tous ceux qui ont collaboré à, à tous ces projets. Et un petit mot aussi à tous les décideurs politiques qui ont accompagné toute cette aventure de MSG, en tout cas, et qui, j'espère, vont pouvoir accompagner MTG. Voilà, ben en tout cas, merci de m'avoir donné cette opportunité, Vincent. Je, je suis vraiment très, très heureux d'avoir pu dire quelques mots. Donc, je souhaite bon vent, bon courage et toute la réussite que vous pouvez avoir avec ces nouvelles technologies. Merci. Merci, Vincent. Merci, tout le monde. Thank you so much for this very warm ending. And this also concludes this first webinar. There's going to be a second part of this webinar, which is going to have the title African Climate Monitoring from Space, and it's going to take place on the 8th of June later this year, and it's going to be contributing to the Paris Agreement. So for everybody whose question hasn't been answered during this webinar, webinar live, you're going to be All questions which were raised on Slido are going to be answered on their website. So if you just look later on in the day, you, you'll be able to find your questions to this. At this part, I'd also like to thank all the presenters who presented today in the morning during the first session and in the afternoon during the second session and everybody who has been here with us now or the people who have been with us since the morning. I'd also like to thank our interpreters and all our participants. And if you're interested in seeing the recording, this recording can also be found on the Umetside YouTube page. So I hope you have, you had it, you enjoyed this webinar and I hope you also enjoy the rest of your day. So this is